mama sa inyo. A 
very warm welcome to Professor Dr. Jonathan Barrett. Sir, he is a professor of obstetric and gynecology, gynecology oncology in Stanford University School of Medicine, California, California. So you hardly need any introduction, sir, because we have completed, as gynecologists, we have completed our residency after reading a, a book penned by you, Derek and Novak's gynecology. Oncology at the University of Texas MG Anderson Cancer Center, USA. Please, and we are requesting as a bouquet, ma'am. We felt very privileged to have with us the respectable Professor Dr. Hannah Ortiz at John T. Matter Hospital, Memorial Hospital. Please give warm welcome to Professor Dr. Hannah Ortiz. Now I humbly invite. In addition, I cordially invite Dr. Swarupa Mitra, the Senior Consultant of Gastrointestinal and Genetic Urinary Death Gandhi Cancer Institute and Research Center, New Delhi, India. We are requesting you to join on stage now. It is my privilege to invite Dr. Nisha Singh, the Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Gynecologic Oncology at King George Medical University, Lucknow. Please help me welcome you to the stage. We also have with us Dr. Sudhir Rawal, Dr. Anita Naithani, and Professor Dr. Lee Xiaomao, but unfortunately they could not make it to our today. I would also cordially welcome all of and to occupy their distinguished seats. <laughs>
in the country. We are very grateful to the international speakers who have come a long way and have spared their valuable time to come and share their knowledge and skill among us. I hope your stay in the country will be comfortable and your journey be grateful. Hope that you will have some time to see the beautiful country. Beyond this dusty and crowded Kathmandu Valley, there are many things to see and enjoy. Majestic mountains, lakes, jungle safari, birthplace of Buddha, rich culture, beautiful architectural temples, and finally welcome people. Once again, I would like to welcome you all to this program. Thank you very much. Invite the organizing chairperson of NCMC 2018, Dr. Elisa Schwester, to speak few words regarding multidisciplinary cervical cancer management course 2018. First of all, I would like to welcome you all in this three-day multidisciplinary cervical cancer course. It is well known fact that cervical cancer is one of the most common cancer in women of Nepal. We are facing challenges every day in our clinical practice. This course, MCMC embodies an effort to represent international multidisciplinary approach to cancer management through education. The main aim is to improve cancer care through international knowledge transfer in oncology providing recommendations for management of cervical cancer based on resources available in the country. So, in these three days, local experts are invited to present their local perspectives on cervical management approaches and challenges. ASCO speakers will provide an in-depth presentation on epidemiology, natural history of cervical cancer, followed by management of invasive and late stage of cervical cancer. And also focusing on survivorship, palliative care, and management of toxicities. Therefore, 250 participants, senior, junior doctors, nurses, paramedics, and other medical staffs from different parts of Nepal. 12 international speakers from USA, China, and India and also 26 national speakers are participating in this three days course. 30 presentations will be given by different speakers in these three days. It's a big mega gathering. As we all know, knowledge is power. We are sharing and learning the cervical cancer management knowledge and skills. We have also invited senior experienced surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, to participate in this course. I would like to request all for active participation and comprehensive interactions. Your valuable opinion and suggestions during the course is highly appreciated. I hope the knowledge transfer will help to improve the quality of cervical cancer care services in Nepal. Thank you very much. The course director of MCAC 2018, Professor Dr. Linus Chuang, to speak on the objectives of conducting this program in Nepal. Three days ASCO and CMC meeting on cervical cancer. It is my belief that in the near future, cervical cancer will be completely eradicated because we know the virus that's causing it. We have the vaccine that can prevent it. We have effective screening and treatments. There is really no reason this being the most common cancer in women in many parts of the world. For many lives that's cut short, young and old women. And women being the pillar of the society. And this has significant impact on our family and the future generations. So I believe it's our obligation as healthcare providers and 
and many of you here are specialists, to really help eradicate this cancer. And I want to thank Nepal Cancer Relief Society. I want to thank Dr. Per Cancer Hospital, Elisa, and many of you to come together today. And although this is, and especially to ASCO, putting up this um, meeting, this may be a small step forward, but it will lead to have us realize the dream of completely eradicating cervical cancer. Thank you. May I invite the Honorable Chief Guest, the Secretary of Ministry of Health and Population Nepal, Dr. Shushi Halam Prakaril, to put few glorious word, words on national policy on cervical cancer Nepal. Nepal
अलग धंधे जुड़े बात है तरफ में आम लोगों को प्रदान तथा स्वास्थ्य का जनसंख्या मंत्री जो स्वास्थ्य राज्य मंत्री जो आप इनको ठीक से गोवा ना करें आम लोगों को ट्वीट करें ना करता कुछ कार्य करें चाहिए जैसे कि जब ये मित्र ने बंद देते कि मिशन पर निकाल रहे हैं बोले जैसे कि हमने बंद देते हो मेरे वाले बंसार छूट मात्रे करें देखो तब आप लोग बात करें कम उनसे ना आप दिल्ली समझें छूट के तब आप पूरा हम चाहोगे चाहे घर में तो मुख्य कुरु के समय कैंसर को लगी है वो ट्रीटमेंट बंदा पर नहीं आमले तो से नहीं और इस प्रोग्राम में लाना जरूरी नहीं चाहिए अतिव और इस प्रोग्राम लाने लायक मैं कभी नहीं बन सके आधार उस बात का सेवा बड़ा और इस प्रोग्राम लायक तेरी तेरी सम्मान दूर दरार सम्मान पुराई वाले डेफिनेटली कैंसर का पीड़ा मेरे को इंसिडेंस और पीड़ा वेलेंस कर दे जान सा पर टाइम भी टाइम ही चुगरे टाइम ही टीपिंग कर दे वाले पर भैंसिलेशन प्रोग्राम रखे वाले अभी वहाँ ने बनाया स्टेज पर लाख सा सारा एक कैंसर एक एक प्रोग्राम में कोई भी गाना बुरा है मंत्री तब आए उस समय को साथ साथ सा मल्टी डिसिप्लिनरी � मतलब देरी तब आया संग तीन दिन ही बस तो मन लागे थे कि वाले मोबाइल वाला मेडिकल डेजुट भगवान ने फिर ही पुराने मोटी पुराने ऐसे नोट पाउंड चला था और मोबाइल दिन के एक्सपोर्ट भगवान ने ताले सोई ना तो ढूँढ का बस तो एक बस तो ना तीन दिन रामरी उन्चा था कि वाले दिव्यताले जबस्वास्थ्य now, I would like to request the respectable, the immediate past president of Nepal Cancer Relief Society, Mr. Divakar Raj Karnikar, to give vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, MC Dr. Uh, Chief guest of this inaugural session, uh, Honorable Health Secretary Dr. Packard, distinguished faculty members from different countries, journalists, participants, audience committee members, invitees, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am very delighted and honored to extend word of thanks to all the distinguished guests for attending this inaugural ceremony of multidisciplinary cervical cancer management course organized by Nepal Cancer Review Society, Arturo Cancer Hospital and ASCO International, supported by Nepal Government, the ASCO Foundation, CERNAN, uh, HK Group, General Agenda of Pharmaceuticals, and Silver Labs. I believe this three-day CMC course on cervical cancer will broaden the knowledge and experience of different countries regarding cervical cancer management, screening, and diagnosis. Especially this type of uh, this type topic is very relevant for Nepal because cervical cancer is the number one cancer found in women in Nepal. Thousands of women are suffering every year. Indeed, we have big expectations from this kind of programs for, re for reducing cancer burdens. I request all the participants to take full advantage and interact between three days this course. One your active participation can make this program a success and fruitful. On behalf of Nepal Cancer Relief Society and all the participants, we would like to extend our gratitude to ASCO International for trusting on us to organize this program in Nepal. Thank you so much, ASCO International. And especially, uh, Ms. Vencia Ayrton, Associate Director of International Education Affairs, Affair ASCO, who has been very kind to interact this the whole uh, year to make this success. And also, I would like to thank our uh, course director, who has committed right now that cervical cancer will be eradicated in the near future. We'll be very much happy, you know, in coming days to work together to eradicate cervical cancer in the world. Likewise, our chief guest, health secretary, who has committed right now to support Nepal Cancer Relief Society, Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital, to work together 
and support financially as well for the awareness, early diagnosis, and screening program in Nepal. Thank you so much. To extend our sincere uh, thanks to all the uh, supporters of this uh, conference, uh, this conference, uh, uh, mainly uh, without their support, it has not been such, uh, possible. Uh, I have also mentioned, I already mentioned that, Serodab Education Group, who is our regular uh, supporter, Devani Janda Pharmaceuticals, Segment and ESCO Foundation. <coughs> uh, we would also like to thank our uh, media personal journalists who is present here. We request them to promote on their respective media to make people aware about the cervical cancer. Similarly, our deep appreciation to all the participants, staff nurses, doctors, professors who are participating for this three-day conference. And he has done very good work. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you so much. Thank you so much sir, for the honor. Uh, now, now I would like to request the immediate past president of Nepal Cancer Relief Society, Mr. Divakar Ras Karnikar, to offer a token of appreciation to our chief guest, the Secretary of the Ministry of Health and Population, Dr. Sushil Nath Bhupyakri. Please help me welcoming our chief guest onto the stage and accept the honor.
the 37. How many of you are, are in training? Is that most of the others or students? If you raise your hands, if you're in training. Okay, so at least uh, half are spending, or over half are spending uh, more than 1% uh, of your time <laughs> with cancer patients. Um, so if the vaccine is available to you, would you recommend it to females in Nepal? Yes or no?
the uh, non-avalence, non-avalence uh, HPV vaccination is effective in preventing how many percent of women from developing cervical cancer? Number one is 30%, 250, 374, 90, and five is 100%. for a 25-year-old woman with stage uh, 1B2, 8 centimeter cervical cancer is, number one, a comb biopsy, number two, extrafacial or simple hysterectomy, number three is radical hysterectomy, number four, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by extrafacial or radical hysterectomy, or five is palliative care. Yeah. Yes, you know, we took a 
ASCO IDEA Award recipient. I'm very happy to have many recipients here. Chikendra, thank you for coming here, and congratulations being the, the newest uh, ASCO IDEA Award recipient. I've known Elisa to be now as a competent and compassionate physician. But I've known her before that, and now she's a wonderful wife and mother of a wonderful, beautiful daughter. But I want to tell you the ASCO Connect people. ASCO promotes research, and it's really helpful when you think about this uh, op opportunity for membership. It's really great what the resources online. I hope you all can join ASCO. Uh, next uh, slide. Oh, I have the Cervical cancer, the most common cancer in women. Dr. Professor Burak will give us a uh, uh, a really a good review leading to the preventions. And is cervical cancer preventable? This is um, to help you with the post-test. With the newest vaccination, it's 90% of the HPV related cervical cancer can be prevented. However, based on the ASCO resource strategy for guideline, and we know for, say, in Nepal, it would be great just to get a quadrivalent, which can prevent 70% of cervical cancer. And what is the best screening method to be presented by uh, Professor Ortiz and Professor Moon? And, um, and which makes the screening program successful? We will give you some uh, examples. So to answer this question, yes, in the house, the most common cancer in women, it is really preventable with 90%. And if you think about something called herd immunity, if you vaccinate 90%, but because of herd immunity, you can actually have more women and men uh, really prevented from developing HPV related cancer. The best, best screening method we're going to talk about is if we can do it at all, it's HPV primary screening, although we're going to screen more patients to be evaluated in the beginning, but over time, you can reduce the HPV related problems. And um, what is the best screening method? It depends on where you are, even in the power. It might be different in Dr. Kerr to do cytology, colposcopy, but we have to be realistic in areas that are so far away from our city. So BIA may be the best way. And screening, to be successful, it takes a lot of our will and determination support. You know, we all can talk about it tomorrow, we can all forget about it. I was really shocked by a, a number that was told that, you know, how much people remember from a meeting. Do you want to guess? Is it 10, 50, or 100%? It's 10%. So, so if we can take it back out from this meeting, is we want to go back and we have a will to try to make, make this happen. So thank you. This is what we're going to, uh, hopefully, to, to uh, look forward to these talks on uh, day one. Thank you. It will, be, uh, it will be a great honor for me to welcome Professor Dr. Jonathan Barrett to share his knowledge on overview of the writing cancer. Your efforts to, uh, to paraphrase my good friend and colleague, Linus Chan, um, to eliminate cervical cancer in Nepal. It is possible through primary prevention and secondary prevention combinations. I think we have an echo, so we need to adjust this a little. Um, to, um, to eliminate many, if not most, of the cases of advanced stage disease, which would dramatically impact the mortality rate from, from cervical cancer. So it's our goal in speaking to you over the next few days to try to emphasize the means by which this can be done. Based on um, my colleagues and what they've already presented, I would reinforce the fact that primary prevention is really where we need to go. And in countries where this has been adopted, such as Australia, we're seeing that the majority of the population of young women and now young men, young boys, are being vaccinated, and we're starting to see the elimination of pre-invasive disease 
which supports the fact that over the next 10 or 20 years, we're probably going to see the elimination of most of cervical cancer in Australia. And there are other programs uh, in Africa that are adopting a similar strategy. So I'm hopeful that over time we'll see the same uh, in, in Nepal and I encourage you to, to um, take this up as your cause. I think if you do, you're going to see a dramatic change and you'll impact the lives of many, many women going forward. And as um, Linus already pointed out, since women uh, are responsible for their families and the children, uh, it's really critical for uh, Nepal as a country to be able to eliminate the scourge of uh, death from this terrible disease. So that's why we're here. Uh, and hopefully, over the next few days, we'll be able to offer our uh, help and guidance and look forward to discussing with you um, our recommendations and what we suggest. Uh, we don't have all the answers. Um, we don't pretend to, but we uh, feel that through an open discussion, we'll be able to, to help, uh, I believe, in many ways. So um, does this go forward? It doesn't. Yeah, something that advances. Okay, well, you'll have the moving experience. Okay. Okay, so go back. Go back. Located in California. That's a country very close to the United States. You're allowed to laugh. See, they're all listening. Good. Um, actually, we take pride in being in being one of the leaders in our, as a state in, in the United States. And, and I think we're very progressive there, and have been very progressive in cancer prevention as well, which I think has been an important part of our strategy in California. Uh, hopefully some of you will get to visit us. So as, all, as you saw from the questions, uh, many of the answers, at least suggestions of the answers, will be presented in this discussion. Uh, at least the part of secondary prevention uh, related uh, to screening uh, for, for cervical cancer and precancerous lesions, which I know at least many of you do or will be uh, seeing in the women um, and uh, in, in Nepal. So, although it's the uh, fourth most common cancer, it's the second in, in un less well-developed and under-resourced, as we would say, of countries, and we know it's a, a, a very high rate uh, in terms of mortality in Nepal. Uh, the estimate is that over a half a million cases, but that's probably an underestimation. And the reason, these data are collected by the World Health Organization from records from around the world. But the problem is, as you are aware, many women get and die from cervical cancer and it never gets reported. And that's particularly true in some places throughout the world because people just don't come in for treatment. So um, we know, for example, in some countries in Africa that there's a much higher death rate than is reported. So these are probably low numbers, sadly. And the estimate of, of over a quarter million deaths um, is also probably an underestimate. So there's a lot of pain and suffering that goes with that because, as you are aware from your care of women, um, advanced stage disease and palliating that is a very big challenge because of the pain that is often associated with progressive disease in, in, uh, in an incurable circumstance. So in addition to eliminating death, we're trying to eliminate suffering. And, um, I'm going to just go on, and this is a map showing the high incidence rates uh, throughout uh, mainly uh, Central and South America, throughout Africa, and in certain parts of, of Asia. I think you can see Nepal in there somewhere. The incidence between 20.6 and 30.2. So. Probably the most fundamental thing is that we've been blessed by the discovery over the past couple of several decades that 99% of cervical cancer is associated with an oncogenic virus, the various strains of the human papillomavirus. And that 
is an extraordinary uh, discovery, which led to the development of a vaccine that can target uh, the envelope proteins of the HPV serotypes, the most common now in a nine uh vaccine, but many associated even with the two or four valent vaccines. So the development of the vaccine is, is, is really one of the first, well, after um, uh, our vaccine for hepatitis, the only cancer-associated vaccine that's highly effective. And I, it's also, I think, should, should say at the outset, you'll hear more about it, it's also incredibly safe. It's, it's essentially the safest vaccine that you'll ever get. It's not been associated with any major deleterious compromise. So it's a safe, effective vaccine, and one that, that we, we believe should be universal. Well, I think the other point in there was that most HPV um, infections, in, in fact, resolve spontaneously, particularly the ones that are, that are non-oncogenic. But even many of the oncogenic viruses don't actively get integrated into the cell's genetic material to cause oncogenesis. They, in fact, the body's own immune response in healthy women will reject many of these. Sometimes it takes a year or two or even longer, but it does go away in many, many uh, cases. So that's an important concept because um, uh, we know that uh, expectant management, particularly of low grade lesions, uh, is more important. Connection closed. Uh, this happens to me throughout life that my connections have been close. <laughs> so while we're waiting for the, the connection to be reestablished, hopefully it will be, um, let's talk. Is this working? <laughs> so what, what we want to talk about is risk factors for developing cervical cancer. Just I mean just I mean I know you probably know all this stuff, but we're just going to go through it anyway. So the number of sexual partners uh, does increase the likelihood that the virus will be transmitted because it is a sexually transmitted organism, although it can be uh, transmitted by skin to skin contact as well. So sexual intercourse per se is not absolutely required for transmission. It's just the most common uh, means of, of uh, of, of transmission. And condoms can reduce the risk, although it's not 100% protective, but sex without condoms obviously increases uh, the risk of, of uh, transmission of HPV, or for that matter, any venereal infection, obviously. So what increases the risk? Well, smoking is a huge cofactor, and there's actually molecular evidence why that occurs, because there are substances in cigarette smoke that actually enhance the process by which genes undergo mutation as the viral particles that are oncogenic become incorporated into the cell cycle. So as that happens, the smoking actually makes it worse. The other thing it does is it breaks down the local immune system and the cervix and the endocervix. So the natural protection mechanisms that would reject the viral infection in early phases is is in fact abrogated. Um, there is an association with parity, uh, although it's not as strong as uh, smoking. And there's, uh, it's hard to tease this out, some of the things like the oral contraceptives, because it also uh, is confounded with number of sexual partners, et cetera, and So uh, I think probably more important is the smoking issue. And people who are immunocompromised, certainly HIV, is associated with a higher risk uh, patients who are, are HIV positive have a very high rate of persistent viral abnormalities, uh, and particularly early invasive uh, uh, disease and precancer. It's kind of an intermittent thing. Okay, so we see that. Hmm. Let me go back one. So it's a little hard to see. Um, go back one. Yeah, it's going spontaneously. Goes, that's going forward. 
it, so you want to go back. Oh, yeah. Go back. Sorry. Go back. There you go. No? <laughs> Got it. So you can see, um, I hope you can see, it's a little difficult um, with the lights on, but you can see where early infection does involve the cell, but it doesn't incorporate into the genetic material. So you don't see on top the, the nuclear abnormalities, but as it becomes, as an oncogenic virus becomes incorporated into the cell uh, nucleus, you start to see uh, up above these abnormal cells, which indicate the fact that the virus has initiated that process of oncogenesis. And this is often associated with these changes that you can see on the surface. That white epithelium that is so well highlighted by VIA or Lugol's or one of the other uh, visualization techniques with or without colposcopy. And then ultimately leading uh, to an early uh, malignant lesion. Could you advance now? Thanks. Linus. And this is just illustrated here where you start to see this progression from normal where you get integration and then it points out into the genetic uh, material of, of the nucleus and where it starts to become more of a high-grade lesion, clearly the CIN3. Um, I will point out that there's always some argument between you know, where, how virulent the CIN2 is. Um, being, I was on the Bethesda today and we spent hours debating whether to classify CIN2 as low-grade or high-grade. Uh, but I'll comment about that as we go forward. Oops, go back one. So what I want to emphasize in this, hmm, keeps going, going back, thanks, um, is that it takes, in most circumstances, in non-immunocompromised patients, it takes a while to progress from an infection to low versus high grade lesion to invasive cancer. And this is often a period of 10 to 20 years. And obviously, the advantage is that if you have a good a screening and prevention technique, even without vaccination, you have the opportunity in the majority of, of immune uh, non-compromised patients to detect this before it becomes invasive. So it's very important to do everything we can to try to abrogate these lesions before they become invasive cancer. It goes forward. And so this shows this kind of thing where most, H I, most HPV infections, particularly the non-oncogenic, but even many non-oncogenic uh, types, will result in a transient infection and then be reversed. Some will progress. The percentage varies on the population. And this is where we see visually that it starts to look like a more prominent high-grade lesion that then, then, so as pointed out here, the ideal target for intervention is at this point where we know that the regression rate, particularly when it gets to CIN3, is relatively low. And this is where you want to intervene and do something about these lesions. Go ahead. Okay. So, Good prevention programs, you want to reach as many women as possible who are at risk, test them or, or treat them, uh, particularly those who may not be able to come back for follow-up. As we know, in any population, there's a group of patients where it's difficult to have them come back, so we refer to that as the method of see and treat, where you try right at that visit, visualize something and do something about it if it looks like uh, particularly if it's a high-grade lesion, that you do something right away um, to prevent the possibility that that patient would be lost to follow-up and therefore unavailable uh, time, perhaps years, that would develop an invasive cancer that would then become incurable. So go ahead. So this is a little hard to read. I think all of these are, are on your um, little sticks, right? So for what you can't see here, I encourage you with this discussion and all the discussions to go back and re-review some of these things and look. I think by the end of the meeting, if you take an opportunity to go back and look at this, it'll make more sense in the second view. And this just shows 
um, the timeline of years that we often see as a natural history for prevention of, of this disease. And I guess the point is that this gives us that wonderful opportunity to intervene, to have secondary prevention if we haven't uh, prevented the HPV uh, infection through vaccination. Okay? So, some definitions. Sequential testing is when you're carrying out a second uh, screening test for those who've had a positive first screening test, and if a precancer is reconfirmed, followed by treatment. And the CM treat is, as I pointed out, if you see something and it looks like particularly a high grade lesion, that you do something about it on the spot. Okay? So, we We've talked about primary prevention being the most important thing, and the critical components of that is what my colleagues will be talking about in subsequent discussions. So let's go ahead. And again, this is hard to read, so again, I would encourage you, this summarizes the WHO um, algorithm flowchart for the management of, of patients based on whether or not uh, there is a ability to to have follow-up or not, whether you're using HPV test followed by um, um, uh, VIA, HPV test alone, VIA alone in cytology, or HPV test followed by colposcopy. Not every um, algorithm is gonna fit every patient and every patient's circumstance, and we recognize the idea is to apply as best possible the algorithm that fits best for that particular group of patients. And so you always have to, to think about what works best in this particular situation for this group of patients that gives us the best chance to prevent an invasive cervical cancer. So um, the, the recommendations from the WHO is premenopausal women older than 30 uh, years of age or younger, uh, women known to be HIV infected or living in a high HIV prevalence area, um, for the screen and treat, see and treat. The screening interval should not be less than five years. And high HIV prevalence countries, women who screen positive for cervical cancer precursors or cervical cancer should be offered HIV testing and counseling. Okay? So what are the pros and cons of the screen and treat? Well, for areas that are low resource and perhaps where the the healthcare, public health system is less well organized, and there's a great concern for follow-up, that has uh, some great benefits because you'll be able to, to uh, do something about a lesion before it progresses in women who you know have a difficult time or there's no available resource for them to come back. Um, there's a maybe a bit of a tendency towards over-treatment, uh, but most of the ablative techniques um, are relatively uh, benign. Uh, screening becomes a once in a lifetime experience rather than ongoing repetitive preventive care if you've done something about it at the time. Uh, there, another disadvantage is the lack of quality control using um, uh, visual inspection with acetic acid, VIA, vinegar, otherwise known acetic acid. Do you call it vinegar here too? Is there a word? Acetic acid. Just a acetic acid. Okay. So these are the ASCO guidelines for the resource, and I did notice that many of you haven't seen this, but this is available. Is this also on the stick, the guidelines? Yeah, we'll, we'll provide it to They'll provide it, okay. So Vanessa, who, by the way, again, has done a wonderful job organizing this. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, says that these, all these screening gui guidelines will be made available to you. So again, after the fact, I highly recommend going and reviewing them very carefully. Uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology spent a lot of effort trying to, to really make these valuable and useful, and hopefully you can apply them uh, more directly in, in the call. Um, you can see from this that there are four categories, and this is true uh, also for the invasive cancer uh, guidelines. Um, depending on the level of resources, maximum, enhanced, limited, and basic. And you can see the whole range of number of times screen based on this. We know that actually one screen alone is one of the most significant things in terms of reducing cervical cancer mortality. 
So one screen is better than nothing. And actually, that's the, the biggest decrement for mortality, is just getting somebody in once. So you have a chance. Even though screening is not perfect, it makes a huge difference to get people in, take a look, and treat them right away if you see a, a premalignant, premalignant lesion. OK? So we all know the anatomy. And I think the important thing to recognize is that some lesions um, develop up in the endocervical canal that you can't see. So colposcopy is a, you know, a, a useful tool, but it's limited, particularly when lesions are up in the canal. And we do see that the HPV also causes adenocarcinoma and adenosquamous carcinoma, which arise up at the squamocolonar junction, many times, particularly in women over 40 or 50, that you can't see. So colposcopy is limited because of that. And so getting that HPV test and doing the appropriate biopsies when biopsies are available is very useful for particularly detecting lesions that are higher up that you can't see. OK? OK? And so we really kind of talked about this. I think the students all study this. That the action is at the transformation zone, the squamocolonar junction, which is not always visible. And through the process of multiple childbirth and maturation of the lower uterine segment, that tends to go up the canal. And that's the important concept. So um, uh, as women uh, progress through having children and um, who uh, ultimately go toward the menopause, many of these Squamocolumnar junctions have moved up the canal and you just can't see them anymore. Okay, so what are the screening tests? Cytology, which is conventional pap smear, liquid based, HPV, DNA test, and visual inspection. And as Linus already, if you can go back just, and as Linus has already pointed out, we do have data now that suggests that a better screen is the HPV DNA test. It's a bit more sensitive and specific. Uh, than cytology. Well, the pap smear is a great tool, but we know that it has um, a problem with false negatives in particular and some false positives. And you can do a lot with um, visual inspection, uh, either with uh, acetic acid or Google's iodine. Okay? And again, you can't read this, but I put it in there because I knew you were going to get this as a handout. So I would review this. Um, algorithm after the flat fact, which goes through, again, the recommendations from WHO and the groups that uh, compartmentalize uh, and suggest, based on the findings, where you should go in terms of uh, screening uh, techniques. Okay? Can go forward? Does it go? Okay. So, VIA. Well, VIA is a very simple tool, and it's rel relatively available. And it's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not 100%, as I'll show you the numbers. But in fact, many, in fact, if not most, of precancerous lesions can be seen at, on the exocervix, uh, particularly when the squamocolonar junction is visible. Uh, so this is a very important tool. Go ahead. Um, and there are various different types of methods that include that with some magnification. Yes. Um, this shows you some pictures of the VIA, uh, the VIA with magnification, and Lugol's solution. A lot of people don't like using Lugol's because it's a little messier and stains, but uh, and it's um, it probably doesn't necessarily contribute anymore to the VIA. Um, this just shows you some more pictures of the VIA uh, with the, and also correlates with some of the Lugol's uh, stain uh, services for. Um, just plastic lesions and uh, invasive cancer. Actually, this invasive cancer, you should be able to recognize just by looking at it. And I think that's the important message. If you see something like this, and I, again, I would encourage our students and trainees in particular to go back and look at these pictures. If you memorize that picture, you'll cure people. If you see that, you know you've got to do something about it right away. Okay, so this just gives you the sensitivity and specificity of these uh, different techniques. Um, these numbers look pretty good, but you can see the cytology number, uh, even the low of 44, it's not that reliable. It's good, but not that reliable. And the average is around 50 to 60% at best. 
And the specificity, these numbers look great, but they're actually poor. So um, we, the techniques are good, but not they're far from ideal. So it's what we rely on. And we know that the HPV test, in particular, has a much better sensitivity than either one of these. Uh, and the specificity is not as, as uh, great. Next. And we know about biopsy. So when you do have colposcopy and, and biopsies available, it's important to use. Go ahead. And we know that colposcopy can help with visualizing. Here's a, a good example of a high-grade uh, dysplasia. Next. Probably the, the evolution of colposcopy based on more recent data is that Probably, if you're going to do colposcopy and you're unsure, more biopsies are better than fewer biopsies because you increase uh, the sensitivity of the procedure. Colposcopy alone is a, a mixed variable tool. I think over time we've learned it's probably not as good as we thought it would be, uh, even in trained hands, because the intra-observer variability is quite high. So you can take a colposcopic image and have 10 of your gynecologists looking at it, you're going to have a lot of variation in interpretation. And it's not because the, the gynecologists are not good or well trained, it's because it's difficult. And not everything you see is exactly what it is. That's an important concept. So um, you can, this is actually shows this. If you look at different groups looking at it and the number, it turns out the number of biopsies correlates better with the outcome of finding something reliable. Go ahead. So we also have the cryotherapy or thermoablation. How, how many people here do cryotherapy? Is that commonly used? A few, not very many. Yeah, about a quarter of you. I mean, it's certainly a very good technique. And in a see and treat circumstance, it can be incredibly valuable because it's cost effective. I mean, it's not a very expensive technique and it's something that um, you can consider expanding the availability of things like cryotherapy uh, uh, when other techniques are not available. And as I said, it's particularly valuable in a see and treat circumstance. And then what about thermoablation? Is that something used here at all? Some. Yeah, a couple. And it's, you know, they're equally effective, so whatever is available that you can use. Um, and then, um, what about LEAP? Do people do LEAP procedures here? More, yeah, okay. And this is good, particularly with high-grade lesions, and if it's starting to go up the canal a little bit, you could, you're essentially doing a, a mini cone biopsy. And so a LEAP procedure is, can be highly effective in reassuring that you don't have an invasive cancer, or if you do, discovering it, and also getting a little bit of a canal. Um, some people, when they do a leap, do what's called a second little biopsy up at the canal, called a top hat, and uh, it's kind of like taking, doing this, <laughs> right? You get the biopsy, and then you go up in the canal and get that top hat, and that gives you the endocervical biopsy as well, okay? And then with a scalpel, a cervical conization for when that's available, and particularly when the lesion looks very extensive and, and maybe a little frightening, and you can't see it. And that's where we reserve this, although LEAP is quite good for most of those, but not, not all. Okay, so CIN1, as I pointed out, there's a very high rate of spontaneous reversibility with these low-grade lesions because these are uh, correlate very highly with HPV that's not infected uh, in the uh, the nuclear apparatus of the cells. It's not incorporated yet, so uh, it, it reverses with uh, normal immunity over time. And um, colposcopy, for, for if you have HPV testing and it shows the most common oncogenic type 16 or 18, uh, or persistent non-vaccine types with, um, with reflex um, uh, te HPV testing, shows high grade, then you can um, but uh, you can see here that average time to progression is a year and a half. So you do have time in patients who can come back for follow-up. Okay? Next. Go forward there. 
So management of, eight, of CIN3 after biopsy, 50% regress over three years, 35% per persist, but only 15 increased risk for invasive cancer. So where you have the facilities and someone where you could do follow-up, it's important to keep track of this uh, group of women. Next. There. Now, CIN2, more recent data suggests that many of these also have viruses uh, that uh, are such that they're not going to cause progression in, uh, in normal uh, services. So you don't necessarily have to treat them if you've got good follow-up. I think the, the fundamental line, if you look at these numbers, is that because a certain proportion of these can progress, and if you're in a situation of more C and tree, even if you're gathering data, or in a follow-up circumstance where you're concerned, it's better to treat than, than just follow up. If you have some a situation where somebody can be confirmed CIN2 should be treated to reduce risk of cancer, um, there's a suggestion of using P16 uh, staining, uh, which may or may not be available. So that's another uh, possibility. I'm going to go on just to save time. Okay, and um, in postmenopausal women, it's a little more challenging, again, because the cervical canal is um, uh, changed. Um, and I think the main thing is that you can follow persistent HPV changes, uh, if, particularly, again, if it's low grade. Um, and as the question implied before, in older women, we tend to stop screening or, or just screen one more time if it's negative. Uh, clearly, if there's a um, a uh, high-grade lesion that's undefined, then you have to do uh, an extensive procedure or a leave procedure. Go ahead. So, lesions covers less than 75%, which was part of the question you were given. And you can see the whole lesion. It's not something that goes up in the canal and you know if you freeze it, you're going to miss um, killing off the cells uh, up in the canal. So, that's a group of patients where you'd want to do a leap procedure or a cone biopsy. Next. Okay, and cryotherapy for those uh, who uh, do it, there's a standard technique, usually with a double freeze. Um, and uh, again, this is in your handouts. Yes, next. And thermal ablation for those that you do it, it's, there's also a description of the technique. It's very effective, just like uh, cryotherapy. And then you know the techniques for, um, for leap. This shows you the leap cone, and um, usually you're using about a, a one and a half to two centimeter loop to get the whole squamocolumnar junction, and as I said, uh, if possible, a little like a one centimeter top half. Next. And I think, again, just to end, that it's better with primary prevention, and hopefully. Uh, the next time we come back, we'll see a lot more integration of, of, H, of HPV vaccination, and we'll begin to see that trend towards eliminating uh, cervical cancer next. And I'd like to thank Linus and my colleagues, uh, also Phil Castle, for helping to assemble the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. For your visionary words. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Eliza Schwester to speak on cervical cancer epidemiology, screening and available care in Nepal. It's the first most frequent cancer among women between age 15 and 44 years of age. <coughs> Nepal has a population of 10.16 million women, ages 15 years and older, who are at risk of developing the cervical cancer. According to the National Cancer Registry Program 2005, cervical cancer accounts for 21.4% of all the cancer in women in Nepal. And the cervical cancer is among the top 10 cancers and number one in women. So uh, according to the Nepal, Can the Nepal Cancer Cervical Prevention Situation Analysis drawn on 2008 Jepaigo, 10,020 new cases of invasive cervical cancer are diagnosed in Nepal every year. About 26,000 to 45,000 women have a precancerous lesion. WHO Information Center on Human Papillomavirus and Cervical Cancer states that 
Incidence of cervical cancer in Nepal is 24.2 per mother. So according to ICO, crude incidence rate of cervical cancer is about 14.9% and mortality rate is 8.77% in Nepal. About 2% of women are estimated to carry SPV 16 and 18 infection at a given time. So the main key fact is about 9.65% million Nepali women are at risk for developing the cervical cancer. Annually, over 2,000 cases are diagnosed and 1,000 death occurs. Maybe it is underestimated due to lack of proper National Cancer Registry program in Asia. So many NGOs are working in the field of cervical cancer screening program to reduce the burden of cancer in Nepal. Many hospitals are providing opportunistic screening programs such as PATIS and VIA. According to the ICO, only 2.6% of women ages 30 to 39 are screened every three years in Nepal. Similarly, about 3.5% are screened between age 40 to 49 and 2.1% between age 50 to 59. From 2002, in collaboration with WHO and IARC, Cervical cancer screening started with VIA in Nepal. So the main objectives of screening should detect ASCUS, CIN1, 2, and 3, and the persistent SPV infections. Pap smear, as we all know, is a gold, gold standard screening method which has a sensitivity of 47% and specificity of 60 to 95%, but quality laboratory infrastructure and Experienced pathologists are required to carry pap smear. So this is the uh, graph swing conducted the pap smear plan done in our Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital. Uh, uh, so we covered 22 areas outside valley and 20 areas inside the Kathmandu Valley. So these uh, women are lined up for doing the pap smear screening camp by the Nepal Cancer Relief Society, Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital. And before during the pap smear camp, we used to uh, educate the woman, the local woman, so how, how important is the pap smear. So we used to do the awareness program before the pap smear camp. So in low middle income countries like Nepal, VIA is being considered over pap smear as a modality of screening of cervical cancer. According to the national guideline of 2010 in Nepal, it approves that SVA, single visit approach, Screening by VIA and immediate treatment of precancerous diseases by cryotherapy in one visit. In 2010, Department of Health Services, Family Health Division, WHO, along with national and international experts, developed a guideline which was published at the National Guideline for Cervical Cancer Screening in Nepal. So what are the reasons for cervical screening failure and causes leading to diagnosis of cervical cancer? The main is women ignorant about screening of cervical cancer and screening method, refusal to go gynecological examinations, healthcare providers do not screen women at visit, and the main is also the infrastructure, including the health workers, instrument, proper laboratories, and pathologists on availability at healthcare centers. Colposcopy and cervical biopsies are not done for the abnormal screen, and patient does not get appropriate treatment for the ASCUS, RCIN 1, 2, or 3. So how do we manage the precancerous lesion in rural areas of Nepal? We usually do a cryotherapy. The government of Nepal has aimed to provide the facility of cryotherapy in every zonal regional hospital for single visit approach. And we also do the biopsy wherever available. A skilled medical professional can take a biopsy before undergoing cryo or leave or organizations. So management of precancerous lesion in tertiary level hospital will usually do a leave or organization. So how do we manage the cervical cancer overall in Nepal? As cancer hospitals are fairly equipped with skilled surgeons, infrastructure and technical facilities to treat cervical cancer in Nepal, we usually do simple hysterectomies radical hysterectomies for early stage cervical cancer and radiation therapy, chemotherapy for advanced stage cervical cancer, possible in cervical cancer hospitals of Nepal at current time. 
So what are the recommendations? Uh, the, main, uh, the main thing is involving a key stakeholders, national leaders, specialists who are working in this field. Target to those female populations who are living in poverty. Increase awareness and educational program. Accessibility to screen, diagnose, and treatment on site. Hospital-based screening program which should be free of cost to all targeted women who are attending gynecological OPD. Another is SPV vaccination should be provided to targeted teenager girls and boys which should be free of cost. So I would like to conclude that organized population-based quality screening, accurate cancer registry, and effective SPV vaccination can control the disease burden of cervical cancer in the world. Thank you. Now it's time for tea break. I would like to request all our guests to move toward the garden. We will resume at 10.15. Thank you so much. If there are any questions from the audience to Professor Dr. Jonathan Berry and to Dr. Elisa Schwester, then please take the questions during the tea break, please. divide my talk in three parts. The first part will be a little bit about the vaccination, what we, we all know and it's just in a revision. And the second part is uh, what the present status of the vaccination in different countries, including the part we are residing in. And third, that is the most important, the challenges and the myths and how we are going to deal with them. So the basics. We all know that uh, it's one of the commonest sexually transmitted infections, that is the human papilloma virus infection. 80% of the women contract SPV, usually in their late teens and 20s. Now, in most of the cases, the virus clears on its own and does not have any symptoms at all. It causes anogenital oropharyngeal cancers and genital warts. Nearly all the cervical cancers, they are caused due to SPV infections. So uh, the part we are deciding in, the part, the part of the world where we are standing, so this is unfortunately the country or the part of the world which are the low and the middle income group, that we are the countries with low resources and yet unfortunately we are the countries with the maximum burden of cervical cancer, we are the country where the maximum deaths that the mortality rates because of cervical cancer and it's a pity and we are again the country where there is no immunization program, there is no screening programs at all and uh, we have a lot of challenges and we are going to discuss them one by one. So the SPV already has, the, I'm sorry, the WHO already has a set of rules, a set of recommendations in 2017. So the main points are the SPV vaccination should be included in the national immunization program of all countries. The SPV vaccine should be 
introduced as a part of coordinated comprehensive strategy to prevent cervical cancer, not only cervical cancer, but also diseases caused by HPV. The primary target population should be girls 9 to 14 years, preferably prior to becoming sexually active. So there are three HPV vaccinations which have been licensed. One is the bivalent vaccine, one is the quadrivalent vaccine. These are pre what WHO pre-qualified. We also have the nine valent vaccine. And all these three vaccines, let me say, they have been excellent safety, they have excellent efficacy, and they, are effect they have very good effectiveness profiles. There's no doubt about that. Now, when was SPV vaccine introduced? So it was in 2006, June, that the United States Centers for Disease Control recommended the administration of SPV vaccine to girls of 11 to 12 years old. Very soon, in 2007, the uh, WPR means the West Pacific region and the Austrian and Australia introduced its funded HPV immunization schedule. Very soon again in 2010, Malaysia and 2011, Japan, they introduced the HPV vaccination in their national immunization program. But unfortunately, once again, in the Southeast Asian countries, the Southeast Asian regions, they have no public, they have no publicly funded HPV immunization. So this is the status presently. The SPV, vac the SPV vaccination is a part of the national immunization program in more than 80 countries, if I'm right, which is probably 83 or 84 countries. Australia, UK, USA, Canada, they were among the first countries to implement SPV vaccination. In Europe, the countries implementing SPV vaccination as a part of their NIP increased from three countries in 2003 to 2007 to 29 countries in 2015, so there has been an increase in the implementation. Bhutan, Panama, and Rwanda, they were the first low-income low countries who have implemented HIV vaccination in their immunization program. So let us look at this map. So you see the green, they mark the areas where uh, vaccination has been introduced as a national immunization program. Now you can see the uh, countries circled with blue, they are the SAR countries, that is the Southeast Asian countries. And the red encircles the countries in the Western Pacific region. So you can see how less the green dots are. And this is a pity. So when HPV vaccination immunization started, the target number of women were 118 million worldwide. But what we have been able to achieve is just 1 million to 13.3 million in the low and the upper middle income countries. That is quite a low number. And if we see the SER and the WPR countries, that is the Southeast Asian countries, only 21% of the, in the two regions have implemented this vaccination. So these are the when we come to South Asia, because this is the area we are interested in, Bhutan, so Bhutan does require us uh, merit some, uh, the other country we actually vaccinating for the last six years in a row with excellent safety and acceptability profile. So uh, the pilot SPV vaccination programs were completed in Thailand and uh, that again the pilot vaccination programs are going on in Bangladesh and Nepal in our country and in India, Delhi, Punjab and UP. These are the three states which have started uh, SPV programs in their uh, schedules. Now this is the, what I found in the internet from the WHO sites about Nepal. I don't know if, uh, if there is anything uh, wrong, then please uh, forgive me. The, pro the proceedings national scale up was done in the competing priorities in those resource countries. There's politics, of course, which is very, very important. The political state of the country, the implementation hazards or, or, or hurdles, the cost, and all these factors, they are interlinked. And when they act together, they become a very, very mighty barrier. So these are the, if we summarize all the challenges, so we can do them and we can segregate them in three parts. The one would be the social, cultural myths or the challenges. 
The second will be the health or the logistic part, that is the issues in delivering these uh, challenges or delivering the SPM vaccinations. And the third and most important probably is the political part. So let us talk one by one. Let us first talk about the social cultural myths and the social and the cultural challenges which we are facing. The most important probably are the lack of knowledge, there are social values and stigmas, there are parental concerns, there are vaccine targets, and there are community sensitizations and advocacies. Needed or not necessary, parents think that for my daughter, they are probably not sexually active, it is not recommended for them, so this is probably useless, superfluous for my children. But probably beneath them, there is a lurking fear that the vaccine will promote promiscuity. So nobody probably expresses them, but the lurking fear is always there. Now this is very important. The cultural sensitivity, if we consider the irrespective of all the geographical locations, the cultural sensitivity was a profound factor among women, irrespective of the geographical status, irrespective of the country where they are staying, and the vaccination, about the vaccination of cervical cancer. Muslim mothers and Asian mothers, even if they stayed in UK, even if they stayed in Australia or USA, they were concerned about giving permission to their daughters to be vaccinated because they were thinking this probably would be a sign of approval of premarital sex. And this is from a very renowned studies. And this is actually, we should wake up to this fact. There were other studies which also said that these barriers which we, are, which we are talking about, there are some barriers which are regardless of a country's income status, regardless of the cervical cancer mortality rates. It is same whether it is in the ACR countries or the WPR countries or anywhere in the world. So what is important is receiving a physician's recommendation or discussing with the parents the HPV vaccine by a physician is associated with a better vaccine acceptance rate. So this is what we need to do, and this is where our responsibility as physician does come. The third is the awareness of the information. If after all these slides, if we are uh, believing that we have taught our masses, we have taught the parents, that we have given them enough information, and now they should believe, and they should take up, they should uh, believe in the vaccination schedules, then probably we are wrong. We have to wake up to another fact. This is a very important paper, and this has been quoted in many journals, in many reports. Percentage of patients, a percentage of parents who have heard about HPV vaccines increased from 60% to 93% between 2005 and 2009. So we should be expecting that the number of vaccinations and the of people or parents agreeing to vaccination for their adolescent girls should increase. But no, this has not happened. The intention to vaccinate has declined from 80% in 2008. So this is quite alarming and we should take it seriously. But here again, there is also a hitch. Like I said, the SVR countries and the WPR countries, we are unique. We are low resource countries. We are different from other countries. So there were studies comparing these between the low income groups and the high income groups. It was seen that wanting more information on SPV vaccination was the reason for refusal among women in our part of the world. But in the HIC countries, that is the high income group countries, vaccination refusal was linked to dissatisfaction with information. So this was very different between the two countries. And that is why we have to tailor me the strategies we take for educating our people. So what are the answers to all these social challenges or myths? We need a tailored health promotion programs. Parents and young women, they should be made to understand the need for HPV vaccination. Of course, abolishing, we have to realize that abolishing the cultural and the religious barriers is impossible, next to impossible, and we should not even try to change that. We have to think that probably the pitching the vaccine as a cervical cancer vaccine instead of a HPV vaccine could help probably. 
Reducing the cost of the vaccine is, of course, very important to make it uh, easily available or easily acceptable to the mass. Of course, advocacy will continue to play a key role even in the future in influencing implementation of the policy, policy makers and as well of the masses. Coming to the rest of the challenges, that is the logistic challenge, that is how to deliver the vaccines and the challenges in the political arena. So if we talk about the health system and the logistic challenges, the infrastructure, human resources are definitely there. Vaccine cold storage, the number of doses, these are challenges in our part of the world, in our part of the globe. Financing mechanism, of course we have to accept that it is costly. For our part of the world, it is very, very costly. Although there are several financing mechanisms, donation programs, we all know of the campaign, we all know about the PAMBO. So they, they are there. But, and we should also know that the low middle income groups with a gross national income of more than 1,550 per capita dollars are not eligible for the GAVI support. This is what I picked up from some articles. There are donation programs also, which are very well known is the GAP, that is the Gaga Cell Access Program. But in spite of everything, we are not able to make use of it. Why? Because we cannot sustain that. The donation programs, they cannot go on forever and after. We have to sustain ourselves. And it is there we lack. It is there we have to strengthen ourselves. So the issue of sustainability, after the conclusion of the donation programs, have to, we have to wake up to that fact. So we have to know that for sustainability, so these are the three factors, the trifecta, which are needed and which we cannot do away with. The money, the political will, and the capacity. So all these three have to work in unison to make the vaccination program successful. successful. There are other logistic challenges, the delivery methods to the adolescent girls. So this is also unique in our part of the country. Why? Because in other parts, the methods we undertake are the school-based programs. We go to the health centers for vaccinating, for um, teaching girls, or use of campaign approaches. So these are generally the approaches taken by all countries. But in our countries, this is also a problem. There are challenges in this also. Why? Because there's poor timetable planning. There's poor documentation, which we have to learn. And most importantly, which probably now there is no cure, the low school enrollment. There are many girls, many children who, are, who do not get the primary education. So how do we vaccinate them? How do we reach them? How do we approach them? There is a high level of absenteeism. So these two are very, very important and we have to work out a way how to meet these challenges. Very important for our country is the political barriers. So political barriers, everything, everything is controlled by politics. And this is a very sad, sad state, very sorry state of affairs. The lack of political commitment to new health technologies. It may not be driven, let me tell you, it is not driven by evidence at all. Nobody goes for evidence. It is more driven by very petty political parties and priorities and interests of a few champions. Nobody bothers about the rest of the evidences which we are talking about. So this is uh, some data from my country and probably this is true in many parts of Asia. The political implementation hurdles are there, but I think, which I have realized and many of us realize, that there is the health experts also, they need to be convinced. They are still unconvinced that HPV vaccination is the need of the time. Of course, I'm not blaming them because they have their own reasons. Because we belong to a country where we have many other priorities. So, but this is something we have to look at this because this may take a little time to do away with. So this is what our health experts speak. So they are still in confidence. So this is the reason they give. And probably I also agree. Incidence of cervical cancer in India has dropped from 24 to 8 per lakh in Mumbai and India just by improving the hygiene and the nutrition. 
and this is a big, big number. So, the proponents of pap smears and other immunization screening programs, they say, is it time for SPV vaccination as yet? Is it too early to measure the vaccine's efficacy in the preventing, preventing invasive uh, cancer of the cervix? So they have their own thoughts and probably will have to work on this also. According to them, pap smear is easy, it is cheap, and it picks up other medical their concerns which ails our country, especially like white discharge, leucoria. So these are also ailing the women population of our country as much as cancer cervix. So pap smear is probably uh, takes care of all these things. But we have answer to this. We have to explain to them that HPV vaccination is a primary prevention and this is what we are looking at if we look at the future, uh, maybe after 10 years. Pap smear is a secondary prevention. Pap smear definitely is good. It has made a lot of difference in the cancer incidence, but yes, it has, uh, SPV vaccination is of course a primary prevention which we have, we cannot do away with that fact. Now, even the reductions of cervical cancer, it can be caused with pap smear, but what about other SPV-related diseases? There are other SPV-related diseases also, which we are fighting with. These are the anal, oropharyngeal, penile, vaginal, and vulvar cancers, and also the genital warts, and they are not very uncommon, they are quite common. So, we do accept, we do understand that pap smear has made a difference. The incidence and mortality of uh, cervical cancer has decreased, but again, the underlying and the bottom line of the fact of that matters is that uh, we need a primary prevention, and that is can be given by SPV vaccination. And pap smear is a good screening, uh, uh, it's a screening method. But is pap smear also, if we go by pap smear, is it going on well? Is it very easy to implement? No, not at all. I've seen in my country also it is not easy to convince women. Like uh, a speaker said, it is very difficult to get women, Elisha was saying, that it is very difficult to get women out of their house and do a pap smear, even if I want to go to their house and do it. It is very, very difficult to convince them. Everything is taken with a pinch of suspicion. So, the pap smear also requires substantial logistic and human resources. It necessitates human uh, women to return at regular intervals for screening and de-screening. And of course, there is no sensitivity of psychological screening. There are other, this is also very important, and probably we all agree to uh, this fact, that in our part of the world, there are competing health priorities. It's not only cancer, there are other health concerns which we are battling with. So, recognizing HPV as a worthy cause of, the, of a country's limited resources in comparison to other interventions is probably the most, most important barrier to implementing HPV vaccination. So, all the low and the middle income countries will have to do our own introspection to consider whether it is feasible for us to invest in both screening and vaccination and this is something which we have to take a call upon. There are other uh, factors, there is involvement. Now this is very unique to uh, SPV vaccination, not like other vaccinations. This is, in SPV vaccination, there are diverse stakeholders. We have to take everybody along when we go in the path of vaccination, implementing vaccination. So these are the sexual and the reproductive health workers. We have the adolescent health workers, immunization, the cancer control groups. So coordinating all these different diverse stakeholders, each have their own priorities, it is definitely an impediment to evidence-based decision-making in this regard. So in conclusion, the main factors that lead to negative intention to receive the SPV vaccination, among many, are the cost of the vaccination, the concerns about safety and the efficacy the lack of information on vaccination, and of course the implementation hurdles where we, I add the politics as well. So what we do, the pitching vaccine as a cervical cancer vaccine instead of an SPV vaccine, according to me, is probably very, very important. 
reducing the cost of the vaccine is very important. Advocacy will, of course, definitely continue to play a very key role in influencing implementation and also our policy makers. Ensuring a sustainable, if, even if we have everything, which I, and everything is provided to us, we have to ensure a sustainable international funding and support and to strengthen our own health system and immunization programs if we want to see our country as free of cancer cervix. Once again, this is not, this is the uh, last but not at all the least, the role of press should be supportive and the adverse effects following immunization should not be misreported and should not be blown out of proportion. This is very, very important. So this is my last slide. We should learn from the project of Bhutan. So a large round of applause should go for Bhutan. This is a low and middle income country and they have, this is actually a modern vaccination program and it should be copied, it should be imitated by other low middle income countries as well. In October 2009 to 2010, pilot phase was started in their country. Very soon, without losing time, the national scale-up was done in May, between May and November 2010. And in 2011, it has come in their national program. So this is something all of us should learn from and we should all try to imitate this. So this is what I believe in, never give up and also never give in. Thank you so much. You gave an outstanding presentation. I really like it. I heard often about clean water and sanitation decreases cervical cancer. I'm really concerned about that statement. A lot of people using saying that we have clean water, we can decrease cervical cancer. But I think it's a confounding factor. When you have clean water and good sanitation, that leads to better education, awareness of cervical, cervical cancer preventions. Exactly, sir. What you said is absolutely right. But uh, if you come and see in India, I'll talk about India. India is a country where 80% of the population live in the, uh, in the less privileged area, that is the villages which are not at all developed. And, but 80% of the privileges, the privileges of health programs are given to the 20% who are in the more privileged. So we give so the privileges to the people who do not require it. And that is where it, it is a sad state of affairs. And that is why we are uh, working, that is the government is more concerned about improving the hygiene. And this has happened, I accept. When we have increased, we, we have improved the cleanliness, the hygiene, the menstrual hygiene. Nowadays, nowadays in India, we are carrying out a propaganda for good menstrual hygiene. So when this has improved over the past 10 years, yes, the number of survival cancer cases has decreased. So this is what the government is pinning upon, even the, our health experts. So if this is decreasing the number of cancer cases, so why not stick on to Paxmia until we are better equipped with more fund? And I have seen in our country, it is a land of diversity. I had gone last week, I had gone to Srinagar for a lecture, this kind of a lecture. They said, that in one year, they have seen only 15 cases of cancer cervix. Mm. And if we go down to eastern part of India, it is a massive number of cervical cancer. So if we uh, see, if we say that the cervical cancer is less because the, because the Muslim population in, uh, in uh, Srinagar, then why is it more in Bangladesh? So probably there, the hygiene and the cleanliness is probably important. I would just like to add on that, uh, this about the menstrual hygiene and uh, cleanliness, sanitation, actually when we look up the literature, we do not have many studies which directly, you know, try to find correlations and all that. So probably that is one important thing because people keep talking what they feel and then we have to have evidence for that. I don't know if, I mean, last year I have given it as a thesis to one of my candidates doing a study of, uh, you know, finding the correlation between menstrual hygiene status through a survey uh, program and uh, a survey questionnaire uh, with the pre-invasive and invasive regions of cervix. So, 
patients who are coming. So yes. I don't know we need to put we, we have to have more data to prove that. Thank you, ma'am, for your intellectual words. It will be my honor to invite Professor Dr. Judith Wood on stage for her piece of words in the topic Elements and Example of a Successful HPV Program in Jambia. Is what has happened in the town. Um, so I'm going to, I have a few slides, but I'd like to have some interaction with the uh, audience, if possible, to get ideas about how you can move from the small pilot projects in Nepal, what are the barriers to moving that forward, thinking about what Professor Mitra spoke about, um, cost and implementation, logistics, um, uh, concerns about from the parents and political issues that um, are things that you all might have ideas about how those can be overcome or at least addressed in your own country. So Zambia is a country in Africa with a population of 15 and a half million. The life expectancy at birth is about 53 years, and as uh, was mentioned in India, 70% of, of the people in Zambia live below the poverty line, and many of them live in rural areas. This country also has a high HIV prevalence, and over 13% of the population have HIV. Cervix cancer is the uh, noted as the most common um, cancer for women, and one where a vaccination program is needed. But I think it's also important to remember that HPV causes not just cervical cancer, and not just cancers in women, it also causes cancers in men. In the US, it's um, oral, oral pharyngeal cancer is becoming more and more of an issue as an HPV-related cancer, and is more common now than cervical cancer in the US. And so moving forwards as vaccination programs develop and as the vaccine becomes more cost effective, I think it's gonna be important that not only girls, but boys also get vaccinated. And hopefully by seeing the improvement in reduction of cervical cancer, countries will recognize that this will save lives, not only just for women, but for all people in countries where vaccination is possible. So um, later on this afternoon, Dr. Ortiz is going to talk about uh, secondary prevention in Zambia, or Dr. Chuang is actually, and how they implemented a VIA program and an HPV detection program. But on the heels of that, they were able to introduce the HPV vaccination into Zambia. And they did it um, just in the last few years by looking at girls in grade four um, or 10 year olds who were out of school, and their pilot program was to be 55,000 girls. They collaborated not only with the Ministry of Health, but also with the Ministry of Education, so that they were able to bring this in as part of the school curriculum and supported by the Ministry of Health. Um, they also had previously done this by using the hepatitis B vaccination that was incorporated into the national immunization program. I'm going to say from my own bias, I think that part of the issue of the cultural issues with the HPV vaccine in all around the world, and including the U.S., was how it was first marketed. It was marketed as a vaccine to prevent a sexually transmitted disease, not a vaccine to prevent cancer. Now, if we think about hepatitis B, how does hepatitis B spread? It spread through blood transfusion, IV drug use, and it's a sexually transmitted disease. But now it's a vaccine that around the world we give to babies. We're not worried that we're gonna make them sexually active. And so I do believe that re-messaging of the vaccine as a prevention for cancer, and I think as a prevention, in the long term, as a prevention for many types of cancer, not even just cervical cancer, because in many parts of the world, um, people are, as, Worry, or more worry about men dying of cancer than they are for women. And so I think rebranding of that will help. In the U.S. now, the, co the commercials for the vaccine don't talk about HPV. They talk about getting cancer. And they show examples of both young men and young women who have cancer and asking their parents, didn't you know? How could you have let this happen to me? And so I think that's a key, key message to change around the world. 
So the pilot was started in 2013 in three different districts. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it targeted girls in grade four or 10 year old, old girls who were not out of schools that attended health centers or with community-based strategies where they went around to villages and actually offered vaccines to the girls. 50,000 girls were targeted. The pilot was completed and it was well received. And now they've started a national rollout program in Zambia of the vaccination. They are having some of the same challenges that many countries are having is reaching girls in underserved areas, so girls who live outside of the cities in the rural areas, the sustainability of the cost and the awareness and education. So I think that this example just shows that the same issues are the issues that around the world are facing. And I think one of the things that would be behoove us all to do is look at a country like Australia where they were able to implement the program. When the vaccine first came, they very early on vaccinated all children, boys and girls, um, and with that herd immunity, have already seen reduction in pre-invasive diseases of the cervix and expect within the next 30 to 40 years to see cervical cancer in Australia basically eliminated. And so I think that we have to keep our eye on the long-term goal, and as was mentioned by Dr. Twelve at the beginning of the conference, we have to take this one step at a time, do what we can today, but keep moving forward in order to save lives. You know, if we think back when infectious disease vaccines were first coming out, these same challenges must have been faced. But we were able to overcome them basically all around the world so that polio doesn't happen anymore. And so if we can do that for polio and other infectious diseases, we'll be able to do that for cancer someday. So the, um, the Doctors in Zambia who were setting up the program here are listed here. Um, and I'd like to thank ASCO for providing me the slides and the information on this. And I'm happy to answer any questions or if anybody has any ideas of how a program, an HPV vaccination program, could be implemented in Nepal or next steps or thoughts, I'm happy to take them. And if everybody's too afraid to speak, oh, Linus. So Chris, do you know how Bhutan is able to support a vaccination program? The question is how does Bhutan support their vaccination program? I tried to find out, but uh, I couldn't get much information. But uh, I talked to a few of my friends in Bhutan. What they said that uh, Bhutan probably has been rated as the most happy country uh, in the world. So the, this, the government had it in their health priorities. So we have to set our priorities. Probably they had set it in the priorities. But I don't know exactly how they have. So maybe when I go for the SARC conference this year, I'll try to find out. I, I've never been to Bhutan, but I heard even the visa application is difficult. They have really strict guidance on who can go and also respect the environment. Yes, yes, it's a yes. very unusual country. That yes, very unusual. Yes, yes. Just don't know how they are funded. Yeah. But they have the priorities. They have placed them at the priorities. That's my Excuse me, I'm uh, Dr. Mutasi. Uh, I, I can add a little bit of what, uh, about this vaccination program in Bhutan. Actually, um, NGO called NNCTR in Nepal started a HPV vaccination mm -hmm. and it was started in 2004 and it um, ended, uh, like she said, there's no sustainable, no, because it was helped by Australian Cancer Fund, uh, Cervical Cancer Fund Foundation and the, that organization uh, vaccinated more than 30,000 school-going uh, school uh, children and then this program uh, our, our organization uh, uh, was helped by a Australian Cancer uh, Foundation. Then the vaccination which was brought from Nepal, uh, some of it was taken to Bhutan. And in Bhutan, they met the Queen Mother. And then since Bhutan is a nice country coming in happy center, but since it's uh, some form of uh, authoritarian rule, so the Queen, the Queen Mother said, now let's have this immunization program. So it, it went into the national immunization program as far as I knew it. I just wanted to add it. Priority, not to put it to the priority. So it was made a priority, but that brings another point is that some of this is relationship building, right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
in Zambia building a relationship with the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education. And so using relationships that you all have, and I know many of you, or at least some of you in the room, have these relationships to influence uh, the people who have a say in setting what are the priorities for health for the country. One thing in Africa, they, it's very unique, is they have a first lady meeting every year. The, the leadership from the first ladies promoting cervical cancer preventions and screening are really helpful. Leaders from the queen, like you said, yeah. in Africa's first lady meeting, they host it every year, trying to improve this. That's uh, very interesting how the down is so successful. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can all use that as an example of how to move forward in Nepal and in other countries. We're still struggling in the U.S. at getting children vaccinated, where insurance pays for the vaccine, it's available, but getting the message out in the education awareness, uh, debunking the myths about the vaccine and what it's for and what are the side effects, I think is important. And so one step at a time, we'll keep working. I just want to make a comment about Judy. That was great talk. Though. It's that um, it's the it's uptake is increased now. HPV vaccination in the U.S. is up to 50 percent of three doses, and you know that the recommendation now has changed to two doses under 14 years old, and also extension of vaccination to the 46 years old, and that's crucial because like. Professor Wu said it's um, in men, one third of um, HPV related cancer in the US is oropharyngeal and mainly in men, and it's rising rapidly. And so it's really important this topic for vaccinations. Thank you.
And yeah, yes, yeah, 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 Dr. Sheila Verba is Senior Consultant Obstetrician and Gynae Oncologist, worked for Government of Nepal for more than 30 years. She is a former Director of Parapapar Maternity Hospital and Special Secretary of Ministry of Health. Please, ma'am. Do you claim that patient receives? Objective of cancer registries is to provide information to the government and agencies in the planning and evaluation of cancer prevention, screening and control program. Short history about the cancer registry of developed nation. The first cancer registry was started in London 1728. The treatment of cancer patients in France. 1740. Cancer morbidity data was first recorded in Germany 1904. First nationwide cancer registration was made in Norway and Germany shortly after the war. Maybe it's a little bit before the war. Uh, expert from Jesse um, can correct me about the years. In United States, cancer registry program was first started in a limited way in 1921. The first cancer hospital was established in New York in 1884 and its, its registry started in 1949. In 1956, the American College of Surgeons formally adopted approval program to develop a hospital-based cancer registry. United States Public Law established the National Program of Cancer Registries. It is under the Center for the Disease Control and Prevention. By 1993, a majority of states in America considered cancer as a reported disease. Types of cancer registries. There are many types of registries, but following are the most common. Hospital-based cancer registry and population-based cancer registry. I am going to focus on two. Hospital-based cancer registry provide detailed data about the personal history of the patient, diagnosis and treatment, and outcomes. It comes to cause and date of death. Types of uh, population-based cancer registry is a core component for the development of national cancer control program. It shows the incidence of new cases in well-defined population and collects case reports from multiple sources, like from treatment centers, from clinicians, from pathologists, and date certificate. Nepal scenario. It is not a long history since oncology services was started in Nepal. Till now, limited numbers of studies have been done in cancer. In 1991, the radiotherapy services was started at Beer Hospital. The first government hospital which was established in 1889. In 1992, Bhaktapur Cancer Center was established. Later on, it was developed and renamed as Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital. 
supported by Government of Nepal, Ministry of Health, and Nepal Cancer Relief Society. With the initiation of Government of Nepal, and with the support of People's Republic of China, BP Koirala Cancer Hospital was established in Bharatpur, out of Kathmandu Valley, in 1992. BP Cancer is the first dedicated cancer hospital in Nepal, providing multidisciplinary services in the field of cancer. In 2000, the radiotherapy services was started in Manipal Teaching Hospital, Spokha, western part of the country. National Academy of Medical Sciences, Beer Hospital, started three years postgraduate MD program in radiation oncology in 2003. Most of the government and private hospitals are conducting their own preventive and screening program, like opportunistic screening. There are many organizations, NGOs, INGOs, working for prevention and screening program, especially for the cervical and breast cancer. There are professional societies working to improve the status of oncology services in the country. Nepal, such as Nepal Oncology Society, 1990, 1999, Sar Federation of Oncologists, 2001, National Society of Therapeutic Radiation Oncology, 2011, Nepalese Association of Palliative Care, Date. Gynecological Oncology Society of Nepal 2018. Many other societies which are not listed here. Many government and private cancer hospitals are coming up now for dedicated care of cancer patients. Little bit about the national guideline. WHO 2002 estimated that only 5% women are screened appropriately in developing nation. There is a national guideline for cervical cancer screening and prevention 2010 in Nepal. Guideline recommends age of screening between 30 to 60 and screening interval once in five years. Still, it is not implemented properly in all their facilities. Cancer registry in Nepal. <coughs> Nepal has very short history of cancer registry program. Being a developing country, there are many obstacles. In 1994, with an initiation of VP Koirala Memorial Cancer Hospital, retrospectively, five years records of six central hospitals were reviewed, such as Tiu Teaching Hospital, Gandhi Children Hospital, Beer Hospital, Virendra Military Hospital, Parton Hospital, and Maternity Hospital. The five years data shows that a total 5,090 cancer cases were recorded out of 172,000 admitted patients. In 1998, cancer registry first started in Beer Hospital, Team Teaching Hospital, and Kanti Children Hospital, but data were not available. <coughs> BP Koirala Memorial Cancer Hospital conducted a hospital-based cancer registry of seven hospitals from 2003 to 2012. Such as Team Teaching Hospital, Gandhi Children Hospital, Beer Hospital, Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital, Manipal Teaching Hospital, Okra, BP Memorial Cancer.
Cancer Hospital Chitton, BP Koedala Institute of Health Sciences, Dharan. House report on cancer registry. Total 56,013 new patients were registered during this period. Male were 46.6 percent. Female were 53.4 percent. 1,107 foreign nationals were excluded. Average age of male, 60 to 64 years. Average age of female, 52 to 54 years. According to a study, among female, cervical cancer, 20.9 percent. Breast, these are the major cases of cancer. Uh, breast 15.5 percent, lungs and ovary 10.5 percent. Among male, lungs 19.95 percent, stomach uh, 7.8 percent. Ten years data shows that cancer in female is more than in male. After a long gap. Now Health Research Council, with approval of Ministry of Health, Government of Nepal, in collaboration with WHO, Tata Memorial Cancer Centre, Bombay, India, IARC, has started population-based cancer registry program in Kathmandu, in Lalitpur, and Bhaktapur districts is nearby Lalitpur and Bhaktapur. NHRC is collecting data of all new cases from 1st Jan 2018 and is planning to expand it in all seven provinces. Why cancer registry is vital? What are the information it provides? First, demographic information, medical history, diagnostic findings, treatment, follow-up detail, and outcomes, cause and date of death. Above information is useful to know the cancer burden of the country. How successful are the implemented programs and policies for prevention screening and cancer control. This information is needed for monitoring, evaluation and future plan. Challenges. Political commi commitment is lacking. Implementation part is slow. Lack of financial resources. Inadequate utilization of expertise, lack of reporting system, lack of cancer awareness and knowledge among health workers regarding cancer registry. Oncology services are costly, lack of diagnostic and treatment facilities in most of the cancer hospitals. Recommendation. National Cancer Registry Program should be under the Ministry of Health or Department of Health Services, Government of Nepal. All cancer hospitals should have preventive department. Coordination among organizations such as hospitals, NGOs, and INGOs through national coordinating body all recall and follow-up system for cervical and breast cancer is necessary. Strengthening of cancer hospital facilities for the quality services. Conclusion. National Cancer Registry Program is the need of country. It provides the exact scenario of trained diagnosis and treatment of cancer. All stakeholders should come under national coordinating body. Thank you.
conversation all day. So that's really kind of going to be the focus. Later on, maybe a brief time, we'll talk a little bit about more enhanced resources. But basic and limited is, how do we get women into screening? What is the most effective kind of screening? Um, and if necessary, do we need people? How do we get people into follow-up? So we've heard a lot about the human papillomavirus. Dr. Berg, uh, describe this very well. I have my own little set of cartoons. So here's a normal cervix. The HPV virus comes in here, infects in the transformation zone. Normal. This is one of my patients who has a low grade lesion. You don't see it at all here. But this is a higher grade lesion and this is cancer. And this can take 10 to 15 years. And the reason this is important is that it has a direct impact on how we screen. So in the old days, you have to come back for your pap smear once a year, very unrealistic, really, even in the enhanced and maximal resource settings, never mind in the low resource settings. So now we're in a setting where we may never see anyone. And so what we really need to do is look at the duration of time from infection with HPV virus to cancer and realize that we have a window. So the goal is really to be able to screen someone at a critical juncture in her life, so that maybe you're only going to get her in one time in her entire life, so somewhere between 30 and 50, 30 and 40, then you've covered her going forward. If you get her at 40, it's going to take 15 years for her to develop a cervical cancer. So in a perfect world, you screen people on a regular basis, but this is an imperfect world. And so the goal is to get at least one pap smear in that block of time. And then the secondary goal is if you do that, if you can get three pap smears in a lifetime, you can bridge the gap, mostly, for that 10 to 15 year period. So when we're trying to simplify what we're doing for our patients in terms of screening, in terms of finding people and getting to them, I think getting one pap smear in your lifetime may save your life and reduce your risk by more than 25%, and getting three will reduce it by almost 80%. And so this is the way the disease progresses, Here's my little doodle, the human papillomavirus, uh, stolen from the internet, sorry. Um, this is the transformation zone. It's the junction between the columnar cells and the flat squamous cells. The virus insinuates in here. This is the most vulnerable area. Just like children are the most vulnerable for disease, the baby cells that are maturing here are the most vulnerable, vulnerable to infection with the HPV virus. The virus might makes its way into the DNA. The, the HPV is a DNA virus that easily integrates itself into the squamous cell DNA and creates dysplastic cells for dysplasia, CIN, and cervical cancer. There are many, many types of HPV DNA. We all know that. So the point is that it infects the, the uh, immature epithelium, and undetected and untreated, it develops into cervical cancer. Was the goal of screening, of any screening program? It has to be cheap. Oops. I'll get the hang of it. It has to be cheap, it has to be simple, it has to be accurate, and we need to be able to find cervical cancer precursors and treat those. 
vaccination, which is primary, is going to prevent the development of cervical cancer in the majority of patients who receive the vaccine. But at this point, the goal of, of screening is to detect cervical cancer precursors and treat them before they turn into a devastating disease that's hard to treat. It has to be accessible. And in Nepal, this is a problem. Because in Kathmandu, we have all these hospitals, but as we get further and further away, there are fewer and fewer hospitals. And how do we accept, make this accessible? We were talking about specific. Um, doesn't require a cytopathologist, does require a place that performs HPV DNA testing. And it has been proven to reduce mortality. Um, the other, um, it does require follow-up for HP for an abnormal, and this is when we begin to talk about the BIA. Oops, I'm just like, um, this is a study published in 2009 in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at mortality reduction. So our goal is to reduce death from cervical cancer. Ideally, we can prevent cervical cancer altogether. We have the technology and the ability to do it, but we don't want, to, want women to die of this disease, and we do this by treating the precursors. In this New England uh, Journal study, very well done study published a long time ago, he demonstrated that HPV testing reduced mortality. It reduced the number of deaths from cervical cancer, whereas pap smear screening did not, and that's why we should use HPV testing. There were numerous studies done all over the world both in less developed and more developed countries that confirmed exactly the same thing. And that's why we need to do HPV testing. Um, so what happens if you can find in your low resource setting, your low resource setting, you get somebody in there, and you know you're never going to get her back. So the next recommendation for screening is to screen and treat. And throughout the 90s and without 2000s, we were looking at these see and treat protocols and how do we treat, you know, get these nurses and these, these practitioners out in these rural areas where really that's our main problem. We use visual inspection with acetic acid. It doesn't require a lot of training. It does, it does require some. It doesn't require a lot of technology, no biopsies, no forceps, no colposcopes, nothing high tech and fancy. It just requires you to have a speculum, some acetic acid, and a pair of eyes, and some judgment and training. And that's that's the hard part. So this is really probably in the low, I'm really sorry, I had a very nervous finger. Um, in the low resource setting, this really becomes the goal, that when we see an abnormality, we can treat it right away. This way, if she never ever comes back, we have reduced her risk of having cervical cancer. Um, you're going to hear about the program that was developed in Zambia. The point about this program um, was that they were able to develop a program for screening using BIA as the main approach. And so they had a group of nurses whom they trained to perform inspection. They didn't need to have a physician. They certainly didn't need a specialist or a gynecologist. And they were able to effectively treat precancerous lesions before they became cancers. And Dr. Chong, uh, Chong is going to speak more to that later. I just wanted to demonstrate this, was the, this is where they were in 2006. And ultimately, they implemented a program, which you'll hear more about. They scaled it up between low resource between low resource and high resource facilities. So basically, in local health facilities, in the surrounding areas, they were able to see and treat immediately. And that's something that needs to be done here, something that we can do. It's been proven. If they can do it, Nepal can do it. All right, so that, this is an example of before and after, and then Dr. will talk to more about it. Um, so what their future, they, they developed this whole strategic plan. I'm, I'm flying past this because we're going to talk a little bit about cases. So we'll move on past this. Um, so there was another study looking at BIA. And I know Dr. Trump was involved in this program and have published several papers on the implementation of BIA. And that's a real, a real life, realistic goal. So the paper was very interesting. It was a small pilot study. And the idea was a model of opportunistic cytology, meaning we do the pap smear when they show up, um, has failed to have an impact on the increasing burden of cervical cancer in Vietnam. So to those people who argue that the pap smear is the only way, you can use this quotation to say, we have done pap smears for decades and decades and decades, and all we saw was a rising incidence of cervical cancer. And there's plenty of data. Thank you to Linus for generating some of that data. So 
the pap smear thinking is, is antiquated and irrelevant. And the reason for that, this was a Vietnamese pilot study. They demonstrated the ability to train healthcare workers, any healthcare workers, to perform visual inspection with acetic acid. And they had a very high rate of detection of CIO2 with a sensitivity of 100% in this study and a specificity of 68%. Specificity is always a problem. They were able to train 36 non-physicians, nurses, physician assistants, midwives, in community rural health centers to do VIA. Uh, almost 2,000 women screened with VIA. They used the WHO framework criteria. It was accessible. It was comprehensive. They were able to cover all of the patients that they had planned to cover. It was high quality, covers I mentioned. And then VIA, VIA compared with the diagnostic PAP test using the gold standard of uh, cervical biopsy. What this means is that after doing their VIA, they wanted to confirm that what they, they were doing was correct and accurate before they took it public, and they did. They were able to use second studies in the study to say, look, this is really effective. We don't need to do a full philosophy on every patient, um, but we did in this study. Um, so what they, what they say in their article is important because as we move forward, we've introduced the concept of HPV testing. We agree that it's more effective. But what we need to do now is take this type of screening and treatment kind of on the road. So how do we get this into our communities? They were able to develop a formal procedure. And this is the next step for Nepal. We know we need HPV testing. We know we need to screen people. We need to, for Nepal, develop a formal program. That's going to be with governmental resources and academic resources to create, in the same way they did in Vietnam, create a formal procedure, train <coughs> local midwives and assistant physicians, paramedics, like you said in your slide, um, in your talk, Eliza, uh, and we can evaluate them, we need to test them, we need to make sure that they're able to do it, and then we can begin to implement the program with MD supervision. So this is going to take some time. But once it's in place, we'll be able to look at our own data and compare with pap smear and our gold standards and give appropriate, appropriate treatment and follow-up. But this was a very good model that was very effective, and it can be done here. It's a similar population, and it's a similar context. So, I'm sorry. So VIA is suitable for lowest resource settings compared with the pap smear. It's suitable, if it was just suitable for Vietnam, it will work in Nepal. Um, and it can be done in community-based sites in low-resource settings with minimal effort and minimal resources. So now we'll talk about a few cases. So what I'd like to do is, we had some GYNs in the audience earlier, some people who were doing, who's doing cervical cancer screening? Right. We're trying to wake you up because everybody just ate and now you're falling asleep. So I'm trying. That's what Vanessa said, try and keep everybody awake. So I'm trying. Okay, so we'll start with one case study, but then I want to hear about your patients. So this is a, an ASCO University study. You can look it up. Um, this is a 40-year-old rural woman. I changed it a little bit because I don't think that HIV is as a big problem here as it is in Zambia. So I changed the slides a little bit. Um, so we have a 40-year-old woman who has four children. She has not had a checkup since she was 25. She doesn't smoke. She's had two lifetime partners. So what would you do for this woman? She is in a rural clinic, right? She's come in. She heard you were coming to town, right? She wants to see what this is all about. What are you going to do for this lady? What kind of screening for cervical cancer are you going to do for this lady? Now that we've had a whole conversation about VIA, that was a hint. What would you do? What would you do? She's 40 years old. She hasn't had a Basically, she hasn't had a checkup in 25 years. What does she need? VIA. Right. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so what is the most appropriate screening? So what we can do is we're not going to do a pap smear, right? We're not because it's not sensitive, it's not specific, it's not going to help her, it's not going to reduce her mortality. We probably can do an HPV test before we do our VIA. Um, it's good to have that in place because we want to know what her, her HPV status is. 
that's not going to determine what we do because she may never come back. If she hasn't been here for 25 years, she's not coming back. And this is true for women all over the world, not only in low resource countries. They can, you know, you can drag them into the clinic. So we do test for HPV, but the most important thing for this patient is to perform the VIA. This is a basic setting, it's low resource, you're never going to be able to get her back. You're going to do high risk HPV testing, but really your goal is to do visual inspection with acetic acid. It's very easy to do. Now I won't move at all. Okay, so basically this is what you do. This is your cervix. This is your transformation zone. And then you have this hazy white shadow throughout. So we don't know whether this is high grade dysplasia, we don't know whether this is low grade dysplasia, but we do know that it's white, right? And when you look for acetyl-white epithelia, you should see white, whether or not you're looking with a green light. Do we agree? Anybody disagree? Do we, do we see a cervical cancer hiding here? Dr. Barrick said, memorize this picture. We do not. So again, we, the problem with VIA is that you know, in, a, in a maximal resource setting, we would say, well, if it's low grade dysplasia, we're going to observe and see her back in six months to a year. But that's not here. Right now, we want this lady not to get cervical cancer. I can't remember this thing. It's too much. So I um, took a picture of one of my patient's colposcopy findings. So here's a patient on this side who had a colposcopy showing punctation and mosaicism, everything that we're supposed to see on a high-grade pap smear. And it was a CIM3, so this lady needed to be treated. So when you compare the hazy white, it's not as good as the gold standard, but the point is it's good enough. And so now what do you want to do? We can do a leap. Any other options? Colonization. Okay, but you need an operating room to do a con. Right, so we can't really do a con. We need a leap machine, we need electrocautery to do a leap, and those are expensive. So the next thing to do appropriate, appropriately, and Eliza talked about this, this is approved in 2010 by the government. So the next thing that we want to do is we ablate on the penis. So we treat with ablation. In this case, we would use a cryotherapy. Those are relatively inexpensive. I know some people use heat. I have never done that. Yes?
technology. I can operate a surgical robot, but I can't operate a slide machine here. Okay. So here, if you have a patient who's coming in and her mother brings her, now her mother's now she's been treated, and her mother brings her in and she's 20, what do we do? Don't look at the don't look at this guy. She's 20. Where do the guidelines tell us to start in a low resource setting? What is the likelihood that a young girl of 20 Remember, it takes 10 to 15 years to develop a cervical cancer. So if she's 20 years old, under fairly safe circumstances, the likelihood that she was sexually active when she was 10 is fairly low. So that to screen a 20-year-old woman is not going to be an effective way of screening for cervical cancer and treating. And so the reason the guidelines say start screening around the age of 30 in low resource settings, 25 in higher resource settings, is because you're more likely to capture an abnormality starting at age 30. So the guidelines for limited basic resource settings is to start screening between the ages 30 and 40, 45, because you're most likely to capture a problem that's going to cause damage uh, later. So at, a at 20 years, you're not going to screen. You're going to start between 30 and 49. And then for someone in basic resource settings, the goal is to screen three times per life, so once every 10 years. Again, because we know it takes a long time to develop cervical cancer, and it takes a really long time to get to the patients. And so what we do is we'll screen three times per lifetime, and that has been proven to reduce mortality from cervical cancer. So say the same patient up above is BIA negative, then we have the benefit of having tested her HPV. If she's HPV negative, we can bring her back in 10 years. If she's HPV positive, then we perform effectively the BIA, we, we visualize, and then we treat if we see an abnormality. So the only difference is that we have to bring this patient back. So she has, the IA was negative, but then we get the, the HPV result back, and then we bring her back to see whether she has abnormality. In limited resource settings, we can be a little fancier, right? So as we ramp it up a little bit, she's a high-risk HPV positive, then maybe we do a pass here to check for abnormalities using the HPV to bias. But we're assuming that we're doing this in a rural setting. So this probably, at this point, doesn't apply if we're trying to create actually outreach programs. But this is the limited resource setting versus the basic. The slides are a little confusing. Um, this way. Okay. So in limited resource settings, again, they have a few more resources. So we prefer always to do it in a high risk HPV setting, right? because that has been proven to reduce mortality. Uh, in some places, they co test with HPV DNA, but really the gold standard should be HPV <coughs> DNA testing. You may want to do cytology, but when you have a limited resource setting, sort of maybe not in the rural areas, you can now begin to consider. Um, actually bringing them back for any abnormalities and doing colposcopy. But again, the goal is always to screen every 10 years. So I think now is a good time to maybe talk about anybody who might have had a pap smear abnormality or a high risk HPV and what happens. Do you test for HPV? Does anybody? Is it available? Yeah. And what happens when you have someone who comes in with high risk HPV? Do you, we're not, is anybody doing VIA? Okay, good. Okay, I don't know. So, okay, great. So, if you have someone who has high risk HPV, do you bring them back? HPV is not available in the government hospitals. It's very limited. It's only available in private uh, setup. So, like in the in the government centers, when ASCA's edge comes, then we go for colposcopy. So, if you had, so you'll do the Pap scan, yeah, without the HPV, yeah. and then you wait for the ASCA's edge. Uh, I'm saying like. Uh, when we have a psychologist, yes. uh, with 
pap smear report coming as at first edge yes. when we go for pulposcopic dilated biopsy. And then from there you do biopsy. And, and then, then you can see. Because HPV is not available in the government hospital till date. So something's going on. So now we have a 42 year old. She presents for cervical screening. Her last screening was more than 10 years ago and was normal. She's HIV negative. She's had three children. She does not desire future fertility. She's a non smoker. So, what do we do for screening? And again, it's dependent on HPV. Um, so, in a basic setting, it's HPV. BIA in a limited setting, in all the other settings, the prospective screening has become or should become HPV testing. So if the HPV test is positive, what do we do next? In a basic setting, we would have the HPV test. Right, so this slide is maybe not perfect. Um, if the AA is positive, the patient should receive treatment. Limited enhanced with triage with cytology and or, or, or HPV genotyping. So these are the, the, the ASCO guidelines for HPV testing. I don't think they're always realistic. And so you have to do what your resource setting and what your equipment will enable you to do. But I think keeping HPV and VIA at the top of your armamentarium is probably the best way. So you're doing the right thing. We just need to do it in more hospitals and make it more widespread. So that requires awareness, government awareness. And I don't think this is going to be even relevant here um, at this point because what we're trying to do is get HPV testing. So I'm just going to slide past that. Um, this is good. So now that you've gotten your ASCH and you've done your cervical biopsy, right, because you have a limited setting. Um, you're going to do a leak. You do your colposcopy, you get your biopsy, you have your high grade pap smear, and hopefully we do a leak. How available is a leak? I mean, how widespread? How many places? No. no. So, how many people have the ability to do a leak if they see an abnormal? Okay, so about a four. So all the more reason to teach your nurse practitioners and your midwives to do VIA in the C and treat model in the clinic setting. Ideally we could do these on everyone. So VIA could possibly not available. I'm pointing at the wrong thing. So again, colposcopy shows, and I think most of us are good enough students to know all of this already. Colposcopy, sh oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Colposcopy shows an acetal white lesion, small percentage of the cervix, not all the way around. We need a picture of this one. There is biopsy, CIM3, and so leap. If leap is not available, cryotherapy, and you rightly pointed out that it should be less than 75% of the cervix. I think leap is probably the gold standard, but obviously not achievable all the time. Um, so you do your leap if you can, and it has negative margins, and what is the next best step? And this is important, because it's hard to bring people back, and I think repeated pap smears, you know, in our training, to, to come back and bring them back every four months, I think is unrealistic, and it's overkill, and we don't need to do that, so we don't. Um, I think this is perfectly reasonable because if we treat it, we're not really going to expect her to develop the cancer unless we missed it um, for a year. And then hopefully her HPV will be negative a year later. And how to follow up on a positive HPV test, if you can, and again, I don't think we're here. We have a positive HPV test. 16 and 18 are the ones most commonly associated with cervical cancer. These patients get a biopsy and a colposcopy, um, and then again in a higher resource setting, and then we can both see and treat again. So in the basic limited setting, 
ablation, cryo, or thermal ablation, um, again, contraindicated. And I guess in a perfect world, we have to refer these patients to the cancer centers and hope that they'll go. Um, we, as we talked, we already have gone over that, so that's pretty good. Um, and in the hand setting, it's a lot easier because you've got the lead machine, you've got the equipment, it's not a problem. And again, the moral of the story is you don't really need short follow-up, long follow-up is perfectly acceptable and probably better for the patients. Um, and the you know, same principle, uh, we can do our, our LEAP. Now there's some debate about whether we should treat CIN2. Um, I think in a low to limited resource setting, as Dr. Barrick said earlier, it's probably wiser to treat a CIN2 lesion than to let it go untreated because of the risk of non-compliance. Um, and basically the bottom line of this slide is, I'm repeating myself a little bit, you just follow up in 12 months. In the general population, how often should we screen? I think we've got the message that at least one time in your life, in your 30s to 40s, will cover you. It's not perfect, but if you can get somebody in one time, then you've managed to reduce the instance of cervical cancer by 25%. Ideally, if that test is negative, once every 10 years times three. So that's a very limited, low compliance. The problem is bringing you back every 10 years. Um, and then in an enhanced setting, we would, uh, we would, I got a little carried away with myself. In an enhanced setting, every 10 years uh, between the ages of 30, in a maximal setting, every five years starting with age 25. So basically, the bottom line is that you're screening your triage and your treatment, as you know, are based on where you are. And I think if we can use the model that they applied in Vietnam with government cooperation, outreach, and education, I think we can actually treat and prevent cancer in a lot of women. And I think it has to be a collaborative effort. You need money, you need funding, um, you need equipment, and you need to train people. But I think the Vietnamese model was implemented quite effectively, and it will work here because you have people out of the communities whom the people trust and you know the, the, all of the misconceptions about vaginal exams and pelvic exams you can begin to dis dispel some of that by just treating the people who are there providing basic primary care and 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 really effectively control cervical cancer and then hopefully establish a vaccination program so if you have any questions or any cases or i try to keep everybody awake all right. I'm professor of Radiation Oncology at National Academy of Health Sciences, NAMS, and Dr. Jitendra Pariyar, the Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Gynecologic Oncology at NAMS and Civil Service Hospital, Nepal. May I invite them to present on pros and cons of VIA and HPV DNA testing applicability in Nepal. Any uh, much needed course in Nepal. And I'd like to thank all the faculties here who were here with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in debate, well, I think my part has been made much more easier because I feel that I have very little to add because much has been already shared and told with a lot of evidences. So today, I'll be speaking in favor of VIA, visual inspection with acetic acid testing as a screening test, very applicable for country like Nepal. Again, Figures again. Why do we talk about cervical cancer? Why do we talk about its prevention? This morning, Professor Linus gave us a message and a very good message that we are 
working towards elimination of cervical cancer. For Nepal, I think that's too early. For Nepal, we are talking about prevention of cervical cancer. Why do we need to talk about cervical cancer? Because in Nepal, it's the most commonest malignancy among Nepalese women. By the end of this debate, we will be losing almost 15 women due to cervical cancer in the world. Because every two minutes, a woman dies of cervical cancer in the world. The scenario of uh, Nepal is pretty much similar to that of uh, other South Asian countries. Like we have pretty high burden of cervical cancer. And this morning, the figure was repeated again. We have around, uh, hospital-based data says around 3,000 cases every year, and we lose around 1,300 women due to cervical cancer every year in Nepal. VIHS, but we know that still our textbook identifies practice as gold standard. And it, is, it has been evident that in many developed countries, incidence of cervical cancer has gone down after introduction of population-based screening program. And I'd like to share some of the experiences of other countries where they have introduced a screening program for cervical cancer. In Indonesia, it's used, it's DIA, Malaysia, Baptist, Philippines, again DIA, Thailand, Baptist, but again in community level, DIA has been very successful in Thailand as well. And in Vietnam, population-based uh, uh, PAPs may, but few minutes earlier only, we were listening to the presentation saying that DIA would be more applicable in a country like Vietnam, which is similar to Nepal. But unfortunately, in our part of the world, we don't have any organized uh, uh, screening, uh, population-based screening program because of, of, of course, resource constraint. Different, uh, comparing different uh, screening tests. Why do I speak in favor of DIA? This table shows that its sensitivity, specificity is almost comparable to uh, baptism or even better and comparable to HPV DNA test. But regarding the feasibility, regarding the resources, regarding its applicability, I think in Nepal, VIA would be more appli app applicable than HPV DNA. Because again, here in floor, if I ask how many centers routinely perform HPV DNA, how many centers in Nepal? Not routine. Not. Because my teacher here, Professor Mita, has had earlier, uh, earlier uh, shared with us that none of the government institute are capable of in performing this test. It's not available in Nepal. What about the cost? VIA test would cost, I think, less than five rupees. Less than five rupees. But SPV DNA test, if like as a clinician, whenever I order it, it will be at least three to four thousand on patient's part. So it's used. So for the present context, I think VIA is more applicable for our country. Why do I keep on saying this? It's more applicable. Why do I keep on saying this? Because it does not need sophisticated lab and it can be done in few minutes time. It's just one minute of observation, patient observation, vigilant observation, and the result is there. <coughs> patient is happy, we are happy. And if there is any yeah, acetobite area as shown in the picture down, that can be taken care of. 
and coming to the evidence again, it's not inferior. The results are very, it's comparable. Sensitivity, specificity, uh, specificity ranging from 70 to 90 percent. So it's cheap, applicable, again simple, and with comparable results. So I keep on speaking in flavor of DI because it's cost effective. It's non-invasive and it can be performed by various levels of health workers. It does not require the gynecologist. It does not require any oncologist like us. And it does not require sophisticated instruments. Nepal is a beautiful country with diversity. Of course, geographical diversity. Sometimes it makes things difficult. Things difficult in the sense when we are talking about population-based programs. When we are talking about cervical cancer in a uh, larger scale, see, it would be difficult in mountain, high hills, and of course in Tarai where houses are way apart. And our clients have to travel uh, a long distance. So they need a test which could give them instant result and if possible, instant treatment if required. So appreciating this fact, even government of Nepal back in 2010 uh, came up with this uh, manual, uh, National Guideline for Cervical Cancer Screening and Prevention. So this is already on the way. And Nepal's goal has been to screen at least 50% of eligible population between 30 to 60 years. And the approach would be single digit approach with DIA followed by cryotherapy as and when required. And this fact is that there are around 3 million women eligible annually for cervical cancer screening in Nepal. So 50% of that would be 1.5 million. So that's a huge uh, number. So in that context, DIA would be more appropriate. And we need to build our capacity as well. We need to train our nurses, paramedics, medical doctors, and even gynecologists. I think it's easier for DIA program rather than SPD DNA, uh, where probably we would require more of infrastructures. Okay, when we are hungry, we just had our lunch. When we are hungry and we have short time, what do we do? In Nepal, we probably would go for YY instant, which is prepared in two minutes. And DIA takes just one minute. <laughs> so, cervical cancer in Nepal is leading cancer. So, should we go for PIA, which takes only one minute, not even two minutes like YY? <laughs> so, with this, I speak, speak in favor of PIA. Thank you. This is my opportunity and privilege to be present here today to debate uh, what exactly the screening methods in prevention of cervical cancer is the optimal best uh, screening tool for Nepal. Debate is debate. It is very easy to produce the data and produce the data and talk on the academic activities like this. But when going into the reality, actually, we have to think so many practical things. And uh, Dr. Sitendra, starting with his person, uh, I would like to say that he said DIA is very applicable in Nepal. But is it really so? I would like to ask him that is it really so? So cervical cancer, when we go, uh, in the morning, there are lots of, from the expertise, the, from the ASCO faculties, 
and, and other Indian international faculties, lots of facts have been discussed already. And uh, wherever we talk, the facts are similar, like cervical cancer screening reduces the global burden of cervical cancer. It is actually very true for develop, developed countries, but not equally achieved worldwide, especially in the low and the middle income countries. In low resource settings, still incidence is high and dying of cervical cancer. And just now you heard that every two minutes, one woman dies of a cervical cancer worldwide, which is a very serious problem. So what is the, we are discussing now, what is the best method for screening, whether it is VI or SPV screening or any other methods like cytology. So talking about the pap smear cytology, now it has come to the liquid-based cytology, the gold standard in the developed countries, no doubt. And VI considered to be, I would like to put query best in the low resource setting. So pap smear, gold standard, highly trained, it needs highly trained uh, technologies and complex lab setup. So these are the facts that it cannot be equally practicable in our uh, settings. <coughs> so the developed countries, they have started it for the last 40 years and in 40 years, the incidence of uh, cervical cancer has reduced so much. But why not it in our country like uh, Nepal? So there are questions of the screening tools like feasibility, efficacy, acceptability, cost effectiveness, and the quality assurance in any of the screening tools we practice. So answer, I would like to support uh, Dr. Jitendra that answers in favor of BIA in low resource settings, that it is an easy setting, no doubt. It is a low cost, but there is some evidence that uh, actually BIA can also be done in the same, uh, same cost as there are facts uh, and research studies from the Ugandan uh, research just now published. It is a only single study, but still, while debating, we can put that into the evidence. And VIA can be delivered by trained health workers. I mean to say that trained is very important. Everything regarding the uh, success or failure of VIA depends upon the trained health workers, whether they are doing it properly or they are not going up to the benchmark. And mobile screening is possible in VIA testing. Screen and treat at the same setting saves time, it saves cost, and it saves the follow-ups. And it also does the lowering of the rate of the referrals. And it is very true in case of the VIA screening. But there are, I have got some arguments, even though these all are very true, but in my mind there are some cons or against the VIA screening. I don't say exactly the negative thing, but we have to consider some very important factors while thinking that whether VIA is applicable in Nepal or is it the HPV DNA testing or both at the same time. So in the VIA, which needs is maintain the continuous resource and capacities throughout. And there are evidences that over-treatment might be there. So it needs the train, training, very excessive training. And sometimes under-treatment, if, if you are in the learning phase, or if your VIA providers, service providers are not trained, properly or not evaluated, then there might be the other treatment which leads not the success of the program. For we have to uh, go through their, uh, uh, what you say, the experience uh, to find out. 
So for SVB testing, I'm talking about a little bit in favor of <coughs> SVB testing because Dr. Rui has given me the cons, uh, <laughs> uh, cons of PIA and pros of uh, SVB DNA. So in favor of SVB DNA testing, significant rate of reduction as opposed to on-screen population is quite true. Higher sensitivity of SPV DNA testing than that of cytology or BIA in the low resource setting, we can say. It is more objective, it is reproducible, it is less demanding in terms of training and the quality assurance. And uh, the care HPV developed in China has high sensitivity than BIA. Uh, that is 96.2% versus 41.4%. And if it is cheaper than the BIA, why not to go for the HPV DNA testing in our setup? And uh, it has got a little bit low specificity, but we can try it if in the preliminary setting, HPV DNA test positive and should not be used is below the 30 years due to the false positive results. So except for the last two blocks, we can go for HPV DNA testing also in our setting. So as for recommendation in alignment with the WSO, it has been discussed in the morning. Maximum resource HPV DNA every five years from the age 25 to 65 until the age 70. In the enhanced setting, HPV DNA every five years starting 30 to 65 years. And if two consecutive negative screenings, then we can screen every 10 years. But for the basic and the uh, minimal resource, BIA is starting at uh, 30 to 49 years up to the age 65 and it can be done once in, once in a lifetime which reduces the incidence of cervical cancer 25% and not more than three screenings in lifetime. So to summarize, in developed countries reduction in cervical cancer incidence and mortality already achieved by large scale cytology no change in resource setting in 30 to 40 years, although we know that cervical cancer screening reduces the incidence of cervical cancer. And thus, introduction of VIA or HPV screening, I still would like to rethink about including the HPV DNA testing in our setup also for this. We, would, uh, we have to advocate our government, we have to produce the evidence in our setup, one arm uh, screening with the BIA and another arm, uh, we, we can introduce the HPV DNA testing, produce the evidence, produce it to the government, and then uh, develop the organized programmed mass cervical cancer screening. And commitment of government for organized mass screening is very important. Uh, when we introduced in 2008 uh, the SPV vaccine, when we went at the local level to the government, they were not listening at all. But when the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation authorities, they came and together with the WHO and the Australian Cervical Cancer ACCF, we went uh, talked with the ministers and the health secretary and they were listening to them and actually we, you heard that uh, the NNCTR could uh, vaccinate 30,000 girls, school uh, girls aged, uh, 14, <coughs> aged uh, 13 to 17 years uh, till now and they incorporated it in the national program in two districts of Chiton and uh, Kaski. So it is very important we discuss why it is successful in Bhutan. In Nepal also it is very true that, and I would like to request that the ASCO can, we can take the help of the ASCO that uh, you can do the advocacy uh, with the government. Uh, you can convince them uh, 
We cannot convince our ministers <laughs> and uh, health advocates, but it, it is you, the organization, international organization, and I have uh, very important questions for you that whether actually BI is should be the screening tool for Nepal, or now should we introduce SPV as the cervical cancer screening tool, or we should go together, produce the evidence, one arm SPV, one arm BIA. Dr. Jitendra will be very happy <laughs> that uh, we are doing the both. And we, we all, gynecologists, I am an oncologist, but very interested in cervical cancer screening starting from the beginning. And we would like to work in this aspect. And uh, as for the National Cancer Control Program, there was a goal that 80% coverage in five years. That means 2010 to 2018, already eight years, we should have screened all the population, at least 50% of the population. But I don't know the exact evidence, not even hardly 5% of the population has been screened till now. So it is a very high time that we need a strong advocacy to the Ministry of Health. We need to develop a very strong guideline. We need to decide which screening tool is important or feasible, practicable in our setup. Cost, I think cost is not a problem because if you can, BIA is also not cheap because it takes lots of infrastructure, trainings, and so many things. If you can spend for BIA, why not to go for uh, HPV DNA? If there are cheaper DNA kits available, like produced by the Chinese government, so we can advocate uh, the Chinese government because it has got a very good connection in the cancer control in uh, Nepal, in BP. Memorial Cancer Hospital. I think if we can advocate them, they can provide us, but it needs support from our government. So at the moment, I would like to put a big question to you all, query BIA, query HPV or both, and how we should go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in many health facilities, there is only one room, and it is very uh, difficult to provide the services because women are reluctant to go for the screening. And if there is a shortage of acetic acid, then they have to travel a long uh, way to go down and process for the acetic acid. In that scenario, we are fighting to get the BI screening. And in that scenario, is it possible to go for this SPV DNA testing? Because uh, we believe that. Uh, the women hardly visit to health facility, and we if we miss them, uh, we, if we don't miss the single uh, single visit of those, it will be a missed opportunity. And secondly, I would like to say that uh, in many health uh, of health workers, these screenings are not included. I visited uh, through the Kartum uh, of ENM and other health workers, and I saw this that from the uh, every faculty, if they oppose to include this kind of screening in their courtroom, so that uh, other training and other uh, expenses will be reduced and it will be cost effective. Uh, so that the more you can go for follow up and monitoring and uh, uh, supervising whether they are conducting well or not. And thirdly, uh, I'd like to know more about the cost effective uh, story of Uganda that uh, Dr. Sorita, uh, sorry, Dr. Arthi has been shared. Uh, will you please share the difference so that we can go through it? Thank you. Can be made available in throughout Nepal. So at present in Kathmandu, I think we are comfortable with VIA because we have to struggle to find a place where SVB DNA test can be done. So we are talking about present context. So in present context, either move with be comfortable with the con conventional methods, cytology, or uh, which is more cost effective, readily available, and most of us are comfortable with is visual inspection with acetic acid. That is one. Number two, 
regarding capacity building, it's true that uh, VIA guideline has been there, uh, cervical cancer screening and prevention guideline has been there since 2010, but it's, uh, I think it's in the process, we are in the process of implementation. The slide that I showed earlier was the training of trainers. So we have completed more than 35 such trainings throughout Nepal. So we expect exponential growth in capacity building so that we can have more of uh, health workers providing such service through uh, even health post and primary centers as well, let alone the uh, uh, big hospitals. So in that context, VIA should be more suitable rather than SPV DNA test. And what was your another query? Uh, probably Professor Art. Regarding the Uganda study, when I was going through the link, uh, I just found out about the much details. Since it was only single evidence I found, I did not go much into the details, but you'll find it uh, in the cervical cancer screening Uganda study. Yes, we begin with this. So, very, very important and very uh, relevant uh, query. Like we are talking about population-based program. It's not clinical program. Like it's not like one-to-one -one patient. We learn today. We cater our service for the upcoming patient. In com community-based program, population-based program, resources has to be uh, organized. And after resources are there, then the program runs. And for community-based program, I think one decade is not a long time. I think we should be patient. I think in next 10 years, I'm sure most of the health facilities will be providing DIA test and the incidence of cervical cancer will definitely come down. I think on, on your behalf, I would like to just answer that question. See, because we say sources, if you can do away with, you have resources enough to start with HPV, you can start with HPV also in that community. But if you don't have, then we are here with you. The argument said that now is the 2018. So should we go still back for the application of our government? Because the cost, all this cost is that this uh, lab have a two or three lab in our uh, a country, they have a very few sample. If that, uh, even in that lab, if I give the ample of uh, uh, this uh, sample, if you give you one time 100 sample, then they can be reduced up to 80 rupees for that, for 80 rupees. And this lab is one time. We don't have to put all the lab in all primary centers, just like in tuberculosis. We have a central center here, tuberculosis. The sample can be easily transferred in the preservation. And that is a very cost effective. Like a pap smear, we very much. You need a, a pathologist, you have a photo transfer, that is not a problem. But here, for the self sampling, there are very lot of studies there where the SVV self sampling has a good result. You don't have to go to even a primary health center. You can go to the east in house. So, for the community labor, now, should we see? For the future in the 2022 up to the, uh, that we have to go for the primary test. And this is, as we said, lifetime that one or two STD can reduce the cervical cancer. Since 2002, we are going for the DIA. Until 2018, we are not able to reduce our cervical cancer burden still now. So now I think we have to change our mind also, still sticking to the DIA. Thank you. Okay. And, and it's not individual patients. We're talking about nationwide. We're talking about population-based. 
So that would be a huge financial implication on government's part. This question session now because of time constraints. Uh, before uh, moving on to our next presentation, I have to make an announcement. Uh, <laughs> the car number 2697 has been parked in a non parking area. Kindly, the owner of the car, please <laughs> provide the key to the security. If you, have a, if you still have one of these, if you put it in your pocket, um, please bring them uh, to one of the, the people working here so we can uh, recuperate all of them in time for our post test later. Uh, the car number again, 2697. Uh, okay, it will be my honor to invite Dr. Sarita Ghire on stage for her intellectual words on the topic, Example of Supreme Programs Nepal. She is a senior gynecologic oncologist at Nepal Cancer Care Foundation. Please help me welcoming her onto the stage. When we talk about Nepal, Nepal contest, I'm sure many of the previous presenters might have shown this slides as well. What is the population and how is our terrain all everything around and total expenditure, how much we are spending in the total health budget. It is not only about survivor cancer screening or anything else. And survivor cancer screening, I'm sure Eliza might have talked about it's less than 5% coverage is and uh, survivor cancer is somewhere around 22%. And this is this data is based on the hospital-based statistics. We don't have a population-based uh, data yet. Only the uh, pathologist are available site. Even all the medical colleagues hardly they do have pathologist uh, 12 months a year. So definitely that is one limitation. And gynecologist, uh, we do have a view that any of the pre-survival lesions, hysterectomy was the ultimate solution. We don't have all the disabilities and uh, leap excisional therapy. It is coming now only. Otherwise, if there is even a single report of ASCO species in the fact, spare patient directly subject to hysterectomy, that is what happened. And then more than 70% very sadly cervical cancer patients they are presenting in the advanced stage and if that is not operable at all. So in this scenario, we started uh, working along with the government to develop a cervical cancer control program in Nepal, formatting uh, national guidelines about the cervical cancer where everything has been included with that background which I had shown. Um, SVB was there, PIA is there, cytology is there, so if they have given us a room to do whatever is uh, available in your setup. And then in 2011, we started a training program. It's from the government level, though different uh, agencies were helping us. And uh, with this training, it was started with a single visit approach. See and treat with the cryotherapy. It, it has been started from 2011. And, in 2000, and for that training, we are using a Japaigo manual. They have uh, just published that was uh, at that time, 2008 and 2009, I think somewhere around, they have published a reference manual and training modules were there. So we just opted the training modules of Japaigo and we started training. The first batch of training uh, I did was in uh, BBKIHS that I remember in 2011. And then we started expanding it to all over the Nepal. And in 2014, after filling, we need uh, we need to revise either that manual which we are uh, borrowing from Japan, or we should prepare existing our scenario to um, help. So we prepare a reference manual, and then in 2015 to 17, a demonstration project has been happened in Nepal. I'll talk in detail about this. So during this time, from the 2011 when we started a training program. We identified these eight sites as a training center. Especially this training was for single visit approach uh, using BIA and cryotherapy. And then uh, with the BIA service expansion, if we talk at present, uh, at least one person <coughs> or one center, I can say, has been trained in 75 districts. Though now it has, country has gone into province level, now we are a little bit in a different scenario. But definitely, in each of the districts, either more than one person has been trained and cryotherapy machine, I'll come to that why it is so less, only 29 is functioning right now, though we have distributed many more than that. 
and the various training linkages have been done with the uh, BOP program, reproductive health program, which the government was running for uh, this uh, vaginal prolapse uh, screening. And private organizations like uh, FPA, Medistops, and NCTR, and all the hospitals also, they started also uh, giving a, conducting a lot of screening camps uh, around them, even going to remote places. So BIS service is definitely in the expansion, and this gives us the opportunity to increase the awareness among the treating physicians as well as among the uh, uh, general population, <coughs> among the females itself. So, um, and the private organization interest, it was a very seeable and very doable. Whenever we talk, okay, come, we can do a pap smear test or we can do a, a whatever cervical cancer screen, it gets a lot of momentum in between. I'm sure all of us agree for that. And then this Gavi demonstration project has come. In 2016, though it has uh, uh, approved in 2015, uh, but uh, the project has launched in 16 and 17, and this has really proven as a milestone if you look uh, uh, in the chronological order for the CCSP implementation program. And then uh, this uh, cervical cancer screening should be free, has been included uh, in the ministry, by the Ministry of uh, Health, Government of Nepal in 2017, uh, and it should be free, they have announced now. This is the scenario. So what had happened in the GAPI project? This has been uh, basically for the vaccination thing when uh, we applied uh, through the UNICEF for the GAPI, China Division of Government had applied. And then uh, it has been a plan to vaccinate sex class school girls or those uh, 10 years old girls who are not going to school, they will get uh, two doses of that vaccine. And they have given us an option, what else you want to do along with this? Because it was in their mandate that two things has to go, not only the vaccine, they were trying to promote other things. So at that time, we advocated cervical cancer screening. Rather, we have taken adolescent health for some level, but we really want to see how it will go if we check together. So this has been planned, like SPV vaccine, we will give to grade 6 girls, or those girls of age 10 who are not going to school. And then bivalent vaccines, a total of 15,000 girls in each year. And that is for the two years program, which was 16 and 17. And then for the screening, uh, we plan to equip all the health facilities of these two districts. And I have to add, this Gavi demonstration project was for two districts. As uh, somebody I have heard saying in the previous slide, uh, that was Chitavan and Kaski district. So, I think I should continue. Um, so, with these uh, two districts, uh, one was Chitawan and one at Kaski, and for these two years, so we um, plan to cover 15,000 from each district. So, by the, uh, along with that, with the cervical cancer screening, when we conducted a survey, we found that there is no equipment in each of any of the health posts. It's very easy to talk over it. Being in a, one of the hospital in Kathmandu and talking, we can do SPV, we can do cytology test, but even little bit out of the of Kathmandu, there is nothing. We can't think of uh, all these uh, facilities making up the level. So at that time, first we thought we'll equip those health centers and then we'll train the manpower along with that. And then early we'll see how the program will go. So now I want to show that another slide. Uh, the goal we kept was we, every woman should get a chance to be screened. Like the same program had run in 2018 in Thailand that uh, daughter was vaccinated and mother was uh, screened uh, over there. So we are just trying to follow the same thing and we want to see how it will go. And we developed uh, with the objectives that uh, we will train the manpower, we will equip the health facilities. And before that we conducted a survey with the uh, female health worker, community health worker, and the health service provider, as well as local leaders. At that time, we identified that we all know proper training modules was not there. Single visit approach, we started from uh, 2011. But the thing with single visit approach is that we have to provide cryotherapy medicine also. So we, taking that, initially we tried in a few of the health centers, we try to provide the cryotherapy, but cryotherapy machine had its one different stories. I will come back to that. So we have to stop uh, providing a cryotherapy 
teach you a lot of sessions and we try to give them a training for ERM. Let's see how it goes. If the lowest level of health facility, that is health post in Nepal situation, we try to train the health post staff for the VIA service to provide a VIA service and social cultural barrier is there, but that always uh, can be easily gone through. And administrative challenge finds culturally, we have to take that. So we develop different lectures, design and modules, temporary modules for VIA training. That is for three days course, not a six day which we used to give for the single visit upload, that was six days course. And then multiple orientation programs have been done to different groups, local leaders, then health uh, workers, then the teacher groups, there's a lot of. And government officials ultimately we convinced uh, to all this. And we agreed that at least two staff of any of the health centers will train of those two districts. So at the health post level, what we did was we gave a three days training on VIA only. And then at the PSCC, that is the next level, just above the health post, we all know that, that's a primary health care center where usually a doctor, a MBBS doctor is posted as well, along with uh, three or four nursing staffs. So at that the level, six days training along with the hospital has been given, and they were trained for single visit approach. They will see and treat as well. And the starter pack, each contains 10 speculum along with a bottle of acetic acid. There was a lot of uh, debate uh, just previous to me how much the acetic acid cost anybody who's a bottle of 500 ml. It just got 500 rupees. So now you can imagine what will be the cost of VIA test. It is, if we train the manpower, that one bottle is 500 ml and that is 100% acetic acid that we can use for somewhere around 1500 uh, women to screen. That is not for one. We have to dilute that to 5%, 3 to 5%, but we are using as a 5% in our this uh, national program. And then 10 cryotherapy machines were distributed to different health centers where we have given a single visit approach training. And uh, training was given, so what had happened is in the Chittagong three hospitals where staffs from the three hospitals were trained and three PSCC staffs were trained, as well as 36 health post were trained. That comes from all your Chittagong, similarly in Kastki, there were three hospitals, three primary health care centers and 43 health post staffs. And total of 526 health workers were trained during this uh, program. So, uh, with the Gavi project, with the result is that the vaccinated girls were somewhere 14,035 with a total vaccinated girl in Chitavan, whereas in Kaski it was 10,937, it was exactly what we were expecting in the beginning. And then uh, we surveyed uh, um, uh, about the screening after one year of our finishing uh, this uh, training. So, in Chitavan, the coverage was 48.2% and Kaski was 40%. And the screening training cost, I have uh, heard about this question previously as well. With the screening training cost per batch was somewhere around 1500 US dollar uh, with supply of a starter pack. Wherever we need uh, to give them a cryotherapy machine, we purchase that and the speculum with uh, this cotton swab and everything we have given them. So the we made service available during uh, after that training on those uh, districts where like colposcopy and lead we we uh, sent uh, gynecologists for the training of uh, colposcopy and lead uh, though we didn't have in Nepal at that time but now we, we are doing that training as well and uh, SPA just for the districts and the hospitals and PSS levels as well as VIA. So gynecologists are supposed to go for colposcopy, medical doctors and staff nurse for single visit approach and then nursing staff, ARM and staff nurse for VIA. And for the service maintenance, it's basically for the quality. I really find this terminology. What we try to do at the time of training only, we, uh, we try to find out whether the trainee had at least a mobile and Almost everybody, it was almost 100 percent, they had a smartphone. So we met them to capture a photograph after taking a consent and to circulate among their friends every time. And in Nepal, we, though we are very poor in many things, but we are fortunate also. Wi-Fi is even very remote eating centers, carbon dioxide comes from India. And every time we have to send that uh, cylinder to the refilling center. That might take some time a month also. The vaccination program for 2020, is, it has been in a plan and along with the training of the screening, uh, it is going on. 
and acquiring resources. And now with the province, each province has allocated a budget very nicely. They have allocated enough amount of budget to either training or to procuring uh, instruments. So we, for that cryotherapy especially and for the training modules, now we try to uh, incorporate a little bit few things called coagulation or thermoablation. Uh, this is a, uh, I, I should have been few slides, but I do. Cold coagulation, it is uh, very easy in comparison to cryotherapy. Whoever has a chance to use this, this is one of the simplest thing. And here, now it is coming with the rechargeable battery. Even if we don't need a continuous electric supply also. So that is the very good alternate way from. And then the inclusion of three days VIA training in this new package we have done. And second level of training. That has always been on our back of the mind that we could have developed a second level of training package for colposcopy and we. So that has been included as well. This is the recently government endorsed, just finished. I have just finished this manual and government has endorsed. This is with the training package for trainers, guides, as facilitators. And this too, one is national guideline. Uh, which uh, Dr. Arati had said uh, very nicely in, the, in her presentation. It has been started in 2008 and will be completed in 2010. But now we are in the process of revising it, including all possible. In, in those packets, all the cooperation was not included. But now as we couldn't use the cryotherapy, we have to replace that. So we are in the process of um, revising this. And this reference manual is already in use. So this is the how we convinced the local leaders uh, at that time. And uh, few pages of the training program we, uh, we conducted in those two districts uh, during that time. And this is a training how we conducted. And so this, uh, another slide is coming. One of the training had sent me through a fiber. It's a how we are uh, uh, communicating with each other. Very nice picture. She went to her health post where she didn't have a hospital bed. So she had used a table to examine a patient. This is the real scenario out of Paris, wherever we go. So this has been done and the service is there. So before uh, coming to my final slides, I'd like to add up uh, two projects we finished one, that is with the HIV female. We did uh, 876 females were screened at uh, Chiku Hospital. They were uh, done with the VIA, then uh, HPV, and then colposcopy, biopsy, and cold coagulation, and deep as a treatment. We have done in one go, we have done for those uh, uh, clients. And uh, with the HPV, we have found that the cost at present all the commercial labs, they are just giving us a report of SPV DNA is present or negative only. What does that mean? That is again a big question and what we are going to do next? That is always a big question with the SPV. They are not giving a genotype, they are not doing those 14 genotypes of the SPV. And we did only for the research purpose, we are trying to see how much cost will come. And it has done along with the government and uh, in those uh, global fund has helped me to do, conduct this. And uh, in that we found it comes per person if we do a 14 SPV genotype and all this process it has come somewhere around 1800 Nepalese rupees. That if somebody is in, was asking previously I think how much it cost for the SPV DNA. That was for the research purpose when cost was not for the, as a commercial one. So we are hoping we can expand it to the national level including all these uh, both coagulation. And definitely as all uh, hospitals and even now the gynecologists are so sensitized with these screenings, I'm sure we can take it further ahead. Thank you very much. Table and great speaker. I'm talking about Professor Dr. Linus Chuan. He will be discussing about the example of screening programs in Zambia. Let's throw it, let's give us money. Why don't we just say, finish? finish high school to sport, what we can make money right when we see the outcomes. So so this is um, the difference between investing in vaccination versus just say forget about vaccination, let's do screening. We're investing in our futures. We know we're gonna spend more years and more money in college and medical school. That's why we can be where we are today. And the same with allow me to say that. 
with HPV primary screening. Chikandra, you did a great presentation. It's not that I don't agree with you. I have my mind set for HPV primary screening versus, versus the mindset. In the long run, investing in human resources to train those people are really expensive. To go around a country which is have very difficult terrains where you're going to have some people out there to do it or not. So I want to ask you to raise a question, women's, raise a question. Do you enjoy spectrum examinations? <laughs> Anyone? I don't see no hands. So there's a study done in Argentina looking at <coughs> HPV stripping, self-collection in HPV, and then send it back to the center for those who are positive with HPVs. And in respect, uh, not able to do genome typing is a problem. But here, HPV can do that. So what the genotyping, the, the problem is that we like to have patients 16 and 18 positive to do cryo. We like to have non-16, non-18 to be reflexed with BIA or PAC. Only those with BIA positive or non-16, non-18 to be treated, because otherwise you're over-treating a lot of patients. So this is um, the situation in the United States. We don't have, uh, we are opportunistic. And we know we have about, um, our cervical cancer patients, half of them have never had pap smears. They just don't want to do it. They don't want to see gynecologists. They don't. And the other half have occasional pap smear. It's not the technology fails in the United States. We have the technology. And a lot of times these insurers cover. We just don't feel like going there. So I think, I think today uh, we, we, we understand that. And, Dr. Professor Verek and I really had the opportunity. We were really, I mean, for me, it's, it was a privilege to work with you on resource stratified guideline. So we understand. So initially, I actually had a big question. Why don't we say country specific? So that is not appropriate, right? Because people wealthy here will go to India or Singapore. I remember when I went to Hawaii to, to, to um, do one week uh, through ASCO. And the doctor called me up, Linus, can you see a relative of mine who has, looks like some kind of urine cancer? I said, sure, come on in any time. But she never came because I heard that she flew down to Singapore. So when you have money, you go to India or go to Singapore. So the same with resource training by guideline is that we know in each country there are some centers have everything you can imagine in Singapore, India, or in the United States. So a resource strategy for Ghana is really based on the resources. Now earlier we talked about the VIAs. Why don't Dr. Perr or Maternity Hospital to VIA? No, because the, there's a basic principle in resource strategy for Ghana is we want to provide the best here whenever it's possible. Not sacrificing our patients. If there's resources available, send them there. If everything is possible, send them here to do PAP and to be weak. But it's not possible. So we have to do what we have to do to do BIA. And so I like the Nepal's example and Zambia was going to talk about earlier, but actually it's the same here and I thank you for for um, Dr. Professor Ortiz um, about Benami's um, example was that I think the concept is this um, to be su to have a successful program if it has to be BIA we, we have certain problems here right thank you. Thank you. so what we do is we train people from those the biggest center in the seven provinces and then from here we start looking at secondary stations train those people and and then spreading out. It's a horizontal development, not a center of Kamandu or Chiwan. And so it's spreading out to seven provinces. And I really like your, I think it's the first time I ever heard of Mother Daughter Program. I think that is really smart, really great if that is, can be done. It's really wonderful if something like a girl reaches 11, maybe a school say, hey, have you seen a uh, go to a program to get vaccination and the mother will bring the daughter to get vaccinated. So I, I think that is really 
a smart program. So that's why I have to say um, there is a reason why WHO, why ASCO, we advocate for HPV primary screening because we believe it's more sensitive. You're going to have a lot of women to go for colposcopy or VIA, but at the down the downstream later on, you have fewer women would have cancer, would have CNS infarct. So this investment is really important. Just like we went to medical school when we can, we invest more in our education. Our reward is higher. So. That's all I want to say, and um, I congratulate your program here in Nepal. It sounds really good, and it just um, takes a lot of political will and investment, and when that ever is possible, think about HPV primary screening. Thank you.
sensitivity was 96% versus 53% for detecting CIN2 plus lesions. Then there was, an, and also the uh, specificity also, although it was a little lower than that. Then another study among 10,000 Canadian women, this was in 2007, again between the ages of 30 to 6. It should be 59, probably. So there also they found that the HPV DNA sensitivity was the highest. So that is how the sensitivity of HPV DNA, HPV DNA test, that's why it's considered to be the most efficacious test. There has been a change in the screening guidelines and WHO in 2013 gave us the screen and treat guidelines and how did it come? It came on the basis of this very important study that was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine and this was a study by Goldie et al. And it was done based on the data collected from five, five main countries, India, Kenya, Peru, South Africa and Thailand. And there was computer based models were used to assess the cost effectiveness of the variety of cervical <coughs> cancer screening strategies. So this was one basis for this WHO uh, um, guidelines that came in 2013 and which advocated screen and treat. Primary data was combined with data from the literature to estimate the age specific incidence and mortality rates and the effectiveness of, this, uh, of screening for and treatment of precancerous patients. They assessed not just the cost of the test, they assessed, uh, took into, uh, uh, took the importance of the direct medical time and the program related cost. So that's how we were discussing in the beginning that it's not just the test of the uh, cost of the test per se, but also whatever is required, the equipment, the uh, cost required in implementing that program, the training and all that. So they were um, assessed and according to the screening test, the targeted age that will be needing, needed, what will be the frequency of the test. So you have to take into account that also. So we know that it's, uh, cytology, we were always recommending it every three years, while HPV DNA test can be done five yearly. So it reduces the number of uh, tests required in a lifetime. So these are the other things which were evaluated and uh, the number of clinic visits required. And in this study, they evaluated the single visit strategies firstly on a large scale from a lot of data. And then the outcome measures, How? what were the outcome measures that they compared to were the lifetime risk of cancer, whether that would re reduce or not, with which study it would reduce maximum. Then the years of life saved, lifetime cost and cost effectiveness ratios, cost per year of the life saved. So there was, uh, a parameter taken at the incremental cost effective ratio and based on that they had tried to find the cost effectiveness. <coughs> In this they found that the most cost effective strategies were those where there were fewest visits and which improved the follow-up testing and treatment. And this one time screening of women at age 35 using either PIA or high-risk HPV DNA, they found that it could reduce the lifetime risk of cancer by 25 to 36% at a cost of less than $500 per year of life saved. And if this <coughs> increased one more testing, so if there were two testings, if there were two testings, that is one you do at the age of 35 and the second one at 40 years, so just adding one more could reduce the lifetime risk by 40%. So that was the advantage. result in reduction, lifetime risk reduction by approximately 
Cost per year of the life save was found to be less than each country's per capita GDP. If it was less than the per capita GDP, then it was supposed to be, it was taken as a cost effective uh, strategy. So VIA in combination with testing for oncogenic HPV, this was the result that it could be used in the screen and treat program and that will be the most cost effective. There was this another study, so this I'm just talking about the studies that were there before the WHO 2013 guidelines came of the screen and treat. So this was another one where they compared HPV vaccination and pap smear screening, so which will be better. And then they found that the HPV vaccination program, this was one study that gave a lot of boost to the implementation of HPV DNA test as the first, uh, as the most important, most cost effective screening strategy. So neither cytology nor VIA, because they were comparing with the two tests, showed a significant reduction in either the incidence of advanced cancer or mortality when compared with the controls. So this uh, showed the potential effectiveness of one-time screening in unscreened population with a high incidence of disease using a reproducible, objective, oncogenic HPV test. Then this is another study that was done uh, by uh, Gary uh, Ginsburg et al. again in 2009 and they concluded that in high income countries with low mortality and high existing treatment coverage, vaccination is the most cost effective intervention. So where already they have good program, they have treatment facilities and all that, so what they need to add on is basically vaccination. But in the low income, low mortality and existing coverage treatment, when there is, it is available for about 50%, vaccination is usually the most cost effective intervention. Uh, but simultaneously, a uh, five yearly or three yearly screening appears to be cost effective. That means also to be added. In the low income, high mortality and low treatment levels, expanding the treatment with or without adding screening would be a very uh, cost effective uh, strategy. One of PAP or VIA screening at age 40 or more cost effective are more cost effective than other interventions, though less effective overall. So point is that here where we have the low middle income countries, it cannot be just we have to work on both, both screening as well as the vaccination program. So then came this WHO strategy which we already know but I would just like to mention a few points that it will depend what program do you choose even with the ASCO guidelines we don't have to forget that it will be depending upon whether you have an existing screening program or not. So in the uh, WHO program also they said that if there is no existing program then and the resources for HPV are available then you can go ahead with the HPV DNA as the primary testing modality. If no uh, screening program exists and uh, resources are there for uh, double testing, the sequential testing, WHO said this, that you can do HPV DNA followed by VIA. So what would happen only thing was that you do HPV DNA and if it is positive still when you do cryo, you first see through VIA whether the lesion is present or not. But then it was almost similar uh, effect of these two things. If there is no screening program existing and the resources for HPV are not available, then the best option is VIA. Hysterectomy is also important. If the hysterectomy has been done for a benign condition, there was no uh, cervical pathology, then you can stop after that. But if there was some kind of pre-invasive lesion for which the hysterectomy was done, then the, uh, the screening has to continue beyond that. And also if it was a subtotal hysterectomy, then the screening has to continue for the cervical uh, cancer. Then this is an important study which I have included and this is actually same year 2016 only and which, has, uh, which will give a lot of information about the cost effective analysis. This is a study done at Harvard, uh, 102 uh, low middle income countries with population over 1 million persons. So they have used some very special computer models, the subjective uh, model that has been de developed by FIHO, we have heard about it before. And they have used to project the cost and health impact 
of HPV 16-18 vaccination in adolescent girls along uh, with screening of adult women. So the combination, they tried to project, if you use this combination, screening uh, the vaccination of girls at 10 years and screening of women 30 to, 60, uh, 30 to 50 years, then uh, what will be the result after 10 years if we take up this program? They have used the multi-regression, multivariate regression models to predict the country and age specific HPV prevalence. They have used the Globacon 2012 data to know the country and age specific cervical cancer incidence. And they have peer reviewed the individual based micro simulation model to predict country specific prevalence of pre cancer. So the ICER, which I just talked, that is uh, the cost effective ratio less than the country's per capita GDP was considered, if it came out to be less than the per capita GDP, then it was considered to be a cost-effective strategy. So let us see a little clearer results. Now, they have divided, so this is their projection, that if they do this program from 2015 to 2024, so over 10 years, then According to the income child, they have the low income countries where the income is less than $1,045. Then the lower middle income countries which have further been divided into LMIC 1 and LMIC 2. Again, depending upon their uh, income groups. Then the upper middle income countries which have a higher uh, they have also been divided into upper middle income country or the UMIC 1 and 2. So according to that, they have seen that if they implement this, if there is if there is an existing psychology program, if it is not there, which is most common which is most common in the low middle income countries, then in the minimal intensity, a screening once in lifetime with BIA will be the best approach that will be used. In the moderate intensity setting, it will be again BIA but to be done every five years. In the high intensity, it will be BIA every five years. So this is how for the low income countries, the recommendation through this study has come out to be like this. In the low middle income countries, so actually what we were discussing, the debate that was happening, depending upon the uh, whether you fall into the LMIC 1 or 2 category, uh, you will have uh, an answer to it. And uh, I'll show another table where they have put up the costs also as calculated in dollars. So that there is a uh, universal, this thing you can match up that way. I'll just show you that. So uh, in the LMIC1 group, if there is no screening method available, no existing cytology program, sorry, then VIA uh, once in lifetime for the minimal intensity, five yearly in the moderate intensity, but in high intensity, which maybe HPV could be used. So that is maybe, uh, you know, areas like where there is a cancer institute or there is a, you know, more population and you have resources better available there, there you could implement this. So it, there could be a little difference in the same country also. The population screening, community screening could go on a different this thing and in the institute you could, if you have the resources, you could go for the HPV testing also. So uh, in the LMIC2, again, if there is no existing this thing, then you have no existing program, then BIA once in lifetime or five, or, uh, five yearly. While if there is an existing program and you are having with pap smear already, then in the LMIC2 category, they say that for the minimal intensity screening, you can do continue with that pap smear only while in the moderate intensity, you do it five yearly. In the high intensity, you can switch over to 
HPV testing. In the upper middle income countries, obviously, mostly you will be having the uh, facility and you can upgrade again in the high intensity areas. And if it is not there, then you can start off with straight away with HPV test. So that is how you have to choose your strategy uh, according to your uh, resources available in terms of money that you have. So the direct medical cost associated with the screening, diagnosis and treatment. So this study actually they added up the cost of everything together. Not just the screening but the treatment of the screen positive lesions and the treatment uh, of the disease if it was positive. Screening costs were not dependent upon the coverage level. And to estimate the unit cost of each procedure, following countries were represented. There were primary data from uh, Ghana, El Salvador. There were three studies from India. Kenya, Nicaragua, a lot of uh, countries that you know about. And all these unit costs were converted to the 2013 dollar uh, value. And uh, using the GDP deflators and exchange rates, extrapolating the costs from their original settings to other countries. So this is the uh, table that I wanted to show. And then they found how, how much would be the average procedure cost. So for this, they found that in the low income countries, VIA cost would be around, if you are implementing VIA, it would be around 1.6 dollars uh, with PAP because in the uh, low income countries we are recommending this so this is not applicable to the PAP and the uh, HPV. Cryotherapy would be having a cost of 11.39 and similarly these are the costs of each procedure that they have calculated. In the LMIC1 uh, category, if VIA is to be implemented, then this is how the cost goes on, increasing 3.12. And if they are starting with HPV DNA test, then the cost will be 8.52 per uh, 8.452 dollars. So this is how you have to kind of choose what is your available resource and whether how much your government can spend on each uh, of these <coughs> screening strategies. So the conclusions that they made were that HPV vaccination of young girls and the cervical cancer screening, because they actually included the whole thing together. And uh, for women aged 35 years can be provided for an av average annual cost of about 2.5 billion dollars at scale. So they have standardized, they have taken it in one currency value so that uh, every country can do their conversion and then uh, decide upon. A 10 year rollout of HPV vaccination from 2015 to 2024 would avoid as many as 4.8 million cases and 3.3 million deaths from cervical cancer. That is the estimate if this is used, this program is used for over 10 years. And similarly, the 10 year rollout of a one time cervical cancer screening for women would avoid 1.4 million cases and about 9,68,000 deaths from cervical cancer. So both HPV vaccination and cervical cancer screening, they provide very good value for public health dollars. Importantly, while the health impact of screening can be observed immediately, the benefits of vaccination will be seen in a long uh, period of time. So that is the difference that if you invest in screening, you will see the results much faster, while uh, we, when we invest in vaccination, the results will be seen many, many years later. So, uh, this is, I have just added these slides because based on the uh, ASCO-based guidelines in India, a slight modification has been done and we have just, uh, the FOXI has developed this this year only and so they recommend that if current screening with cytology is present in an area and the lab meets quality indicators, you see if you can afford HPV and if yes, you switch over to that. If you cannot afford uh, HPV, then you continue with your program that you have. If there is no current screening, then if you cannot afford HPV, start with VIA and if you have facility for HPV and try it, start HPV testing. So this is the table showing uh, the good, for the good resource setting. As I said, primary HPV or 
cytology or VIA depending upon if you have it or you don't have it and try it will be with cytology or some newer modalities which this is applicable to you know the best institutes wherever because actually in India we have a lot of diversity. I was just talking with uh, Dr. Linus also that places will be there where you have everything almost same as you know the best in the world but there will be peripheral areas where there will be kind of nothing also. So therefore you cannot say just one thing for the whole population. So you have to have a little, so we have put it as good resource setting and the limited resource setting. And then similarly with the management options, the lead colonization, cryotherapy, thermal coagulation, all this is available in the big institutes and can be used. And But yet the sing, uh, single visit approach is to be uh, you know, it is considered better, cost effective than the others and so if it is in the periphery, it is screen and treat that is with wire, you just find a wire positive and you do a cryotherapy. But in the hospitals where you are doing cytology and you are still doing the corposcopy, it is like a C and treat. If you are doing a corpo, you are seeing it is a hybrid lesion rather than taking a biopsy and waiting for the report to come after three weeks. If it is the scoring is already you know high score a lesion, then you can do a leak at the same time. So that is how in the treatment also, depending upon the good resource or low resource setting, you have to decide your treatment. So uh, just to uh, tell a few points again about so why we say HPV DNA uh, is more cost uh, testing is efficacy we have all seen but it is cost effective because of the infrastructure that is required because uh, we have all heard from the morning since morning that the VIA or cytology the infrastructure required has much more cost than actually the HPV DNA testing. <coughs> So less infrastructure is needed comparing to cytology definitely and with VIA it may be slightly raised only, not too much raised. Then the other difference comes because of the frequency of screening. Cytology we all know three yearly, while VIA we have seen studies, five yearly is the standard for the maximal uh, this thing. Lower than that we can, like in the enhanced, we can do after one, two uh, five yearly testings, you can switch over to ten yearly setting and in the limited we had 10 year only. So because of the in, uh, reduced frequency of test, if you see the overall cost, lifetime cost, it is not so good. So this we have to understand. And then the age, okay, I talked about the frequency first, then the age of screening also, screening women, because we are limiting it to the target group that is 30 to 50 years for the uh, peripheral settings. So this leads to, uh, it represents approximately 20 to 25 percent of the entire population, but this is the most targeted. So for the peripheral settings, when we put up the program, then we focus on this group. So targeting, and we have seen the studies also that even a single uh, a screen, uh, single, uh, single lifetime screening also has a very positive result. So we can start off with it. HPV testing is recommended after 25 years, although I think uh, ASCO or they have recently uh, reduced it to 25, saying that from 25 to 30 also there is a good number, and so they recommend, but uh, till this time, before this, or everywhere we were recommending HPV DNA testing only after 30 years because of the lot of clearance that goes on uh, before 30 years of age. So for them maybe it can be used uh, before that also from 25 but um, largely better after 30 years. Frequency I have already talked. Then this uh, word about the rapid HPV test, the care HPV and few more companies are bringing the test. Once we have them and the cost of them because uh, as told in Indian rupees they say about 1000 rupees will be the cost of care HPV if we get that. And uh, so with the additional advantage of self-sampling uh, that we have and the rapid, the result comes in three hours. So for the peripheral setting, there has been some study, big study from India, also from South of India, and they have shown very good results. The acceptability is good among patients because of the self-sampling and the same day you're getting the HPV DNA test result and you can go for the screen and treat strategy with this 
HPV test. So once that is available at a uh, cost which we can afford in different countries, that will be the best thing. So uh, the conclusion is that HPV DNA uh, testing as a primary screening tool is the best uh, test available. And the second will be the VIA as the primary screening tool where no program exists and resources are not available for HPV. Switch to HPV for existing screening programs if you have the resources and frequency of screening will depend upon your resources so you can change according to that. Thanks for patient care. Uh, I would like to invite our immediate past president of Nepal Cancer Relief Society, Mr. Divakar Rajgarika, to add his expertise on the topic, engage, engaging patient advocates. Over to you, sir. So, bear with me. Uh, engaging patient advocacy. So I would like to give an uh, introduction of uh, Nepal Cancer Relief Society. Uh, uh, it is a non-profit thinking, a community based non-government organization. It was founded by the late uh, Princess Jenny in the year 1982. Uh, it's aimed to create awareness, prevent and control cancer in Nepal. Uh, this is a uh, a map where uh, we had 42 district branches in all over the country. Uh, working about uh, 10,000 volunteers are working in these uh, branches. And the activities of Nepal Cancer Relief Society is uh, preventive, curative, palliative, advocacy for the support group, fundraising. And uh, in preventive activities, uh, we are doing cancer awareness classes for different groups and uh, do pastoral camps, interact with patients and families, other cancer screening health camps, and to distribution of uh, all uh, materials in health camps, seminar conferences, and uh, organize different programs on World Cancer Day and World Local Life Day. These are just the uh, picture of pressure, hundreds, few. And uh, especially we, uh, HCIS does its uh, awareness uh, programs in the religious group. Sometimes we do on the uh, 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 ethical uh, group, uh, caste group, and sometimes uh, to the uh, women's group in different levels, such as uh, army officials, uh, women groups, uh, police officials, uh, women's group, and there are different women's group in Nepal. These are the pictures. Uh, Awareness class and screening program done in different parts of the country, where the Dura Park is, the Western Park. And this, these are the Eastern Park, Chapa and Bara. And this is the, the you know, uh, the street play, uh, which uh, you get, which uh, they are trying to show the uh, uh, cancer uh, symptoms and uh, knowledge of cancer. Several uh, breast cancer classes in uh, colleges. We normally uh, give uh, these classes in the uh, women's colleges, uh, plus two or two plus ten, so that they can put uh, knowledge inside your parents. Yes, and uh, we have done in past one uh, breast cancer, uh, you know, uh, uh, fashion show. Joining a fashion for breast cancer patients. The in the ramp, the doctors. Uh, nurses, uh, breast cancer patients, and other uh, you know, models, they uh, walk on the ramp, and uh, we need 30 minutes of cancer awareness, of a breast cancer awareness program to the participants, uh, about 500 uh, participants were here. And this is our uh, uh, weekly <coughs> classes for you know, senior artists, uh, because they are the one who can spread knowledge, who can spread the message to the community. So. From here, uh, we would like we would like to spread the knowledge about cancer and antitoxin research. And this is same kind of uh, we call it Dohi Gip. Here, a traditional folk song composition was done, and the uh, lyrics was written with some message of cancer. Uh, here, uh, we are doing a fashion screening screening camp uh, in different district. Uh, with the help of uh, Cancer Hospital. Uh, 
number of awareness program conducted so that it was uh, general for 2017-18, total participants 17-21, and uh, 19 programs inside the valley, and uh, 21 programs outside the valley, total participants 4,318 outside the valley. Likewise, this is how the cancer screening panel conducted uh, 22 areas outside the valley and 20 areas inside the urban area. And the participants in this cancer screening inside the valley, that is Afghanu, Bandhubo, and Dalipu, the three districts. So cancer, there were 3,066 participants. Likewise, the breast cancer, 2,084, 18, and the general cancer, 2,264. Uh, like very personally, it's cancer screening outside the valley, uh, 6,207 in cervical cancer, and uh, 5,457 for uh, breast cancer, 4,796 <coughs> in general cancer. This is the same result. Total parts went to uh, 5,832. Now we're finding 4,624, uh, 689 bacterial and uh, they were high grade condition for public health. Uh, NCRS has been working to control tobacco in Nepal because in Nepal, uh, lots of uh, women and men, they smoke. So one of the major causes of many cancers. So we focus on that as well. Uh, it has been working uh, in anti-tobacco campaigns since 70 years. Uh, it is playing a role towards FCTC ratification, advocacy, and most importantly for the pass of tobacco product control and regulatory in 2010, which is already in the introduction page. NCI has lobbied with majority of the policy makers to pass the bill. Won the case against the tobacco industry regarding the policies on the display of warning signs and pictures on the cigarette packets. Uh, now, in our country, there is 90% picture signed in each packet of the cigarette, which is already passed by the government. These are a few games of the World on Tobacco Day. And uh, one of the things that NCI is uh, doing is to educate the youth people, uh, girls and boys, uh, on awareness for the anti-tobacco. So we have been uh, formed a quiet, that new club of youth against tobacco. And uh, they work themselves and they educate other uh, fellow friends for, uh, with this group. And we educate them. We inspect this quiet group uh, and they will work themselves. Uh, and curative uh, and palliative care, uh, we, uh, Nepal Cancer Relief Society has been running uh, Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital since 1994. <coughs> it is uh, working, it is running in collaboration of, uh, with Nepal government, Rotary International, and local community. And uh, there is a nine member uh, opening committee. Which, comes, which is the, the chair by the chairman of Nepal Cancer Relief Society. So this is a non-profit making community-based cancer hospital, and this is the first cancer hospital in Nepal established. And next, uh, we have a, a NCIS Nan Cancer Center in the eastern part of Nepal. It's just beginning, and uh, NCIS does regular tumor board meeting once a month in Kathmandu, where almost all the oncologists and pathologists, that's all the doctors participate in meeting. <coughs> and NCS KGS Cancer Headline, KGS is a group of hotels of uh, Nepal, and we have signed on MOU with the uh, KGS group for the Cancer Headline. And works of seminar, conference, and other organs. Yes, October Cancer Hospital. It's a liquidity related uh, cancer hospital. We have uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, palliative care. The quality care is supported by Canadian uh, NGO. This is the building of uh, the Cancer Hospital. Uh, yes, I already told you, the NCS Tour Board Meeting, which is uh, sponsored by ETKM Distributor Power Limited, supported by Rotary Club of Bangladesh. We have already conducted 85 meetings till date, uh, 305 cases discussed till date. From this year, we have started Tour Board Meeting. Webinar, a webinar with Pokra district. And we are planning to add more uh, web based uh, tumor board This is a picture of a tumor board meeting where all the doctors are sharing. 
And this picture is a, a signing ceremony between NCS and AG's group of hotels for the cancer treatment uh, program. And she is the one of uh, counseling for in cancer treatment. Last uh, January 2018, we organized an international cancer conference. Uh, with supported by uh, government of Nepal, endorsed by UICC, in collaboration with Cancer Council of Queensland, which was a three-day conference of its end. Yeah, this is a few picture of uh, that international con cancer conference. For the first time, UICC president, uh, Dr. Professor Sanchia, was here uh, in this program, and uh, there was a uh, uh, there was uh, the delegates from Australia and uh, of many other countries. Uh, we had an international partnership with the uh, World Health Organization, uh, WHO, Cancer Council of Queensland, Cancer Council of Australia, the Bloomberg, Australian Embassy, Direct Aid Program, Above and Beyond, the Non Communicable Disease Alliance. This is uh, the end of the uh, program. In with the mutual. Yeah, this is a group photo in the Cancer Hospital during the uh, uh, Cancer Conference. Uh, we did last year, we did cervical uh, uh, cancer screening awareness program in uh, 12 districts of Nepal. Local partnership for cancer care and awareness. Yeah, there is a different in the Nepal government is there. We always work together with the Nepal government. Rotary clubs, lions clubs, JCs, various women groups like the different uh, religious, professional women groups like police and army, religious group, caste groups like Raskadika Smarts, Mantena Smarts, etc., and business houses. Uh, we do, uh, NCS does one uh, good morning tea, uh, which is, uh, uh, is a fundraising as well as a awareness creating uh, program. Here you can see the beautiful ladies. They are the winner of Miss Nepal. The one uh, left is uh, Miss Nepal 2017, and other are the uh, title winners. And we, we invite, we engage in, in the uh, awareness and fundraising. Uh, this is a, a fundraising program. Uh, the tea is sponsored by one of the hotel restaurant or banquet halls, and uh, these ladies come and speak about something about you know, mm -hmm. cancer. Uh, ask them to the, the, the audience will donate whatever they want to donate. Maybe 1,000, 500, 100, whatever they want to donate, and they listen about the cancer. And we distribute them the you know, uh, pamphlets, posters, etc. And these uh, programs are conducted in all the district branches of NCIS, 42 district branches, every year. And these are the same program. Uh, some uh, municipals. 2000, we started 2013, uh, 2015. They are very well eager to work together with us. Uh, recently, we, October Cancer Hospital, uh, started to establish one uh, business patient support group, which meets once a month for interaction with patients and doctors, which has been very effective. Uh, there is doctors, if they have some questions or something, they can ask the doctor, or even they can interact with the patients. Or Families. This is very important, this is very effective. And we are the head and neck cancer support group and breast cancer support group, which uh, they are meeting frequently. Now, improvement required uh, for this advocacy and awareness program, we need to build a building a patient central health system, we don't have right now. Need to need for national, national cancer control policy, I think which we don't have right now. Governments will start a free screening center for common cancer like breast, um, uh, breast uh, mammography, pap smear, etc. And our government is provi providing one lakh rupees, that is uh, uh, $1,000 for each cancer patient in Nepal. They can get one, uh, $1,000 from government for the cancer treatment. So this is very uncertain, and it should be more than this. Uh, we, we are approaching government to establish one center, at least in one province, diagnostic, diagnostic uh, center, such as a baby, a or 
a breast cancer screening, at least two, two diseases. So that can be uh, easily available, and it, this will be free. People are not willing to pay you know, money for the screening program, because all, maybe a 70%, 65% people are poor, they cannot afford that. So for those people, we need a free screening centers. No, I do see for the patient after cancer. What we have found here is uh, patients uh, doesn't ask you know frequent questions to the doctors. They obey that you take that that medicine or you do that, and they listen in one way. Most of the cases in the, uh, these kind of things found in villages where people are not educated, where, where people are you know poor. So uh, what we uh, I'm going to tell you is choosing patient we trust. We should choose the patient that we can trust. And become partner with the patient. Be close with your patient. So I feel that you can interact, you can ask your any questions. And plan for the future and seek more. Seek psychological support when needed. The problem is uh, in Nepal, the patient doesn't want to disclose that we, uh, they have a uh, cancer. And even they don't want to go to see the male doctors. And even they don't want to share with their families, friends. Even they don't want to see the, uh, you know, later cancer. They are afraid of cancer later. So what we need to do is we have to educate them and support them. And the relaxation and stress reduction. So, so we have done in future, uh, in the uh, past, in Bakum Cancer Hospital, few you know, healing kind of, uh, uh, we, uh, we call it Reiki. That is Japanese word Reiki. That is also a psychological treatment for the patient admitted in the cancer hospital. So uh, these kind of uh, small things uh, can, uh, you know, uh, affect uh, cancer patients, and we have to boost their more. Uh, so Nepal uh, Cancer Relief Society is doing this kind of uh, moral support and psychological support to the cancer patients of Nepal, through its, uh, its uh, district branches as well. And uh, most importantly, control negative emotions. Here in Nepal, uh, because people are hiding cancer, because they think that cancer is a, uh, you know, something you must have done in your past, you know, you have done something past, so you are getting cancer. These kinds of needs are there in Nepal. So we have to eliminate this kind of negative thinking. We have to, you know, bring them in positive emotions. Find ways to enjoy life. People are still not enjoying, you know, when, whenever they get cancer, they are, they want to stay in, uh, inside the room, uh, they don't want to talk with the friends or colleagues, you know, or the relatives. This has been a problem. And we need to tell them to socialize more and be open and honest about your disease. Yes, we should be honest and honestly say that you know, I have a cancer. That does to be have every cancer patient. And uh, seek inspiration from others with a similar condition. Yes. The support group can help this kind of interaction with the other cancer patients, how their families are, you know, are talking about this, working about this, how they are getting here. Recently, I, at the tea, I have talked to that I heard one, uh, met one uh, breast cancer survivor in Singapore, one of the countries. She was telling me in the States that how she got cancer, breast cancer, and after surgery, how her husband treated her. She said that uh, when uh, she got uh, breast surgery and uh, recovered and went home, her husband said, look, uh, my dear, whenever, when you had a breast, uh, there was a barrier between me and you. But now you have, you know, take out the breast. So we are more, much more closer. So don't worry. This is the kind of, uh, you know, the support by the family. So this kind of uh, support, we have to teach. We have to educate the cancer families as well. Not only cancer patients. We have to educate cancer family as well. How to treat, how to behave with the cancer patients. This is very important. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Enzo.
of first day of MCMC 2018. And the last speaker to honor us with, the, with her presence is Ms. Ihmanesa Igeti. She will be talking on the topic, the post-taste attitudes and knowledge assessment. Please. I enjoyed the day today. Do you want to say anything? about uh, treatment of uh, cervical cancer and how, uh, how to manage that. So, um, anybody else? All right, thank you and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.